to everyone. Please be seated. He's on his way. Okay. You have Jack? And everyone, uh, the court will call State of Wisconsin versus Daryl Brooks, case number 21, CF 1848. May I have the appearances, please? Good afternoon, Judge Sue Upper, Leslie Basie, and Zach Wichow, appearing for the State of Wisconsin. Um, yeah, uh, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Daryl Brooks, Jr. Um, here for this matter without prejudice by special appearance, and I would like to ask if it pleases the court that someone can please render the account for me at this time. All right, the appearance of Mr. Brooks is noted. The court will not be addressing that last request of yours. We are here today to continue with the sentencing hearing. I do have the Zoom up. I have not brought in any of the individuals um, from the waiting room just yet. I wanted to know if there was anything the court needed to address before uh, bringing those individuals in and then turning to Mr. Brooks to start his portion of the sentencing hearing from the state. Uh, there's uh, two issues that I'm aware of, Your Honor. Uh, one is we're requesting if the court would briefly allow a young girl by the name of Brooke who provided an impact statement yesterday to read that statement again. She felt like uh, she did not uh, get a a good chance to do that yesterday and it's a brief statement if you would just allow that and then I just wanted for the record to let the court know that at the close of today's hearing we will be prepared to address the motion for stay pending appeal all right thank you um, can you remind me was the was she interrupted at all based on anything that went on yesterday was that either the court taking a break yes it was related to, uh, or Mr. Brooks' removal from the courtroom, yes. All right, any comment or position on the request that she be able to restate her victim impact statement prior to the people we have on Zoom for you making their statements, sir? Um, I don't recall uh, that particular victim um, being interrupted because of the issue with me being uh, sent to the other courtroom. Um, I think it may have been a break that may have cut uh, that particular victim off from the statement. Whatever the circumstances were, I have a request from a victim to give a statement. I'm gonna honor that request. 
um, and allow her to make that statement before I turn things over to you and the people who are on Zoom on your behalf, okay? Other than that, is there anything else you wish the court to address before I hear from victims or your family members? Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to uh, let the court know that uh, there will be, uh, in fact, four people speaking on my behalf, if that pleases your honor. All by Zoom? Um, yes, correct. Are they all on your list? Yes, they are. Okay. There no, no, no new, no new entries. Um, all pursuant to uh, what I submitted to your honor. Madam Clerk, do we have three or four individuals on by Zoom? I have three. I guess I just wasn't clear if the fourth was going to be. Is the fourth with another of the individuals that already is on our Zoom? Do you know? Um, I believe the fourth was um, trying to uh, access the Zoom link. They uh, expressed that um, they had already had the Zoom ready to speak on my behalf, but they were having a little bit of trouble, I guess, accessing the link from the courts. Um, tell us the individuals you have on by Zoom right now. I have Mary Edwards, John Allsworth, and John Young that I see in the list. All right, who would be the fourth then, so? Uh, Miss Marsha Winters. Marsha Winters, all right, we don't have a Marsha Winters on. I know your mom has the Zoom information, it's an ID. Um, a meeting ID and a password, not a link. Um, so hopefully that can be. I think he sent the link too. He created oh, he created the link. So All right. This should be both. I'll have Madam Clerk also um, put in the chat to the Zoom the meeting ID and password once again, with and indicate that it can be provided to Ms. Winters. Yes, Ms. Winters. Occurred. Um, should that, she need it? That might be the the mix up. Maybe she was having. Maybe she thought it was a link. Or I, I'm not there sure. There can be a link, and the clerks have that as well, so it's we'll get it. Okay. We'll yeah, put it in the broadcast. Uh, there's a chat function. We'll get it in there so they can pass it on, and hopefully at the appropriate time she'll be able to join. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. All right, then with that, um, if Brooke would like to stand up. I know it's a minor. Yes, and you thank you. The microphone is being handed to her. All right, go ahead. And thank you for being here. Hello, my name is Brooke Sorensen. I'm Virginia Sorensen's granddaughter. The things that I, the things I miss about my grandma are me and my sister Mackenzie doing foot races around the driveway, and my grandma would do commentary and time us. She always cheered us on at all of our activities. I would DJ at dance at granny parties and carry the banner at parades with my grandpa while Grammy danced. When we would get on the school bus, she would say reading is the key to learning to be nice, kind, brave, and angels watch over you. After school, we would talk on the porch. Other times when we came over to her house, we would play games together, go to the playground, have drawing contests, dance parties, and work on granny routines. She would give us snacks when we watched some of our favorite movies like Polar Express and Coco. When we first found out that she was gone, I started to cry, and I would cry every night. I miss her so much and still do today. Daryl Brooks, you took her from me, my sister, and my family. The things, the things we will miss the most are not seeing her again, her smile, her laugh, being able to talk to her, and doing fun things with her. My sister and I pray every night for our Grammy and our family. Grammy, I will see you in my dreams, and I know you will be watching over me. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor, for accommodating that request, and we have nothing further at this time. All right, then. Uh, we will bring in the individuals who are on the Zoom, and then I'll give them some instructions on how that should proceed. Do you have all three trying to join? Is this your mom? Yes. All right, so I can see Don Woods on the Zoom. Miss Woods, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. 
All right, thank you. I know you have your camera on. You're unmuted. There are two other individuals on the Zoom. They currently have their cameras off. I believe they're both muted. I would just simply ask that um, we take one person in turn. You are on the Zoom. It is viewable in the courtroom. I want to acknowledge, ma'am, I did receive what I believe is a written statement that you faxed uh, to the court. Yes, ma'am. All right, and then if that is, I'm not sure who joined us at the moment. All right, um, is that Ms. Edwards? All right, Ms. Edwards, yes. um, if you could please, uh, I, I'm gonna have Ms. Woods talk first and then I'll have you next. If you could keep your camera yes, off and your microphone muted until it's your turn to talk. That way right. I can give my full attention to Ms. Woods. Sure. There we go. Very good. Thank you. All right. So once again, Ms. Woods, um, I believe you sent in a fax yesterday. Is that right? No, I, um, I believe it was this morning. Oh, this morning. All right. I have yes, that ma'am. and I've read it. Um, go ahead. What would you like to tell the court? And thank you for being uh, with us today. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I have two things I would like to tell. One is a written statement, Your Honor. And then I have a poem I would like to read after my statement, if that's permittable. Okay, thank you, thank you. Mental illness affects everyone. It destroys lives, families, and hurts society. For far too long, it's been a dirty little secret in families that no one wants to talk about. Mental illness is the elephant in the room that so many pretend it's not there. People who suffer from it are often shunned by families and friends, rejected by society and made fun of, the subject of bad jokes, ridiculed, and judged on YouTube, podcasts, Facebook, and other media posts, used in campaign ads, disrespected, stripped of their dignity. No one cares. No one sees their pain or hears their cries and pleads for help. They are the forgotten ones and viewed by many of not having a place in a society. It is no fault of their own that they have become ill and began to change from the person we all knew. Once viewed as fun, loving, and kind are now the outcasts of society. We say they're what's wrong with society. They're idiots, unfit. They don't they need to be disposed of, thrown out with the rest of the trash. They serve no the same my brother's keeper doesn't apply to them. And the Bible in the book of Philippians chapter two, verse four, it says that each of you not look only to his own interest, but also the interests of others. Mental illness calls them to do the unthinkable. They must be punished. Yes, I agree there should be some accountability to their for their actions. But we also must render help. What good is punishment without correction to prevent the act from help happening again? In their cases, or many of their cases, treatment, therapy, medication hospitals and institutions that specialize in helping those who suffer with Ill mental illness need to be offered. And I believe these places can help those who suffer become mentally well. I believe lawmakers and society as a whole need to recognize mental illness. Mental illness cannot be eradicated with prison virus. Mental illness is going to always 
be there. It's invasive. With treatment and therapy, medication, and hospitals and institutions that specialize in the treatment of mental illness, it can be controlled. What else can we do as a society to help those who suffer from mental illness? How about showing a little compassion, empathy, and some understanding? Families need to advocate for those who cannot speak for themselves or who struggle to understand what's happening to them. Lawmakers should support by providing resources to individuals so they can get the help they need. Now, I've been dealing with mental illness for over 30 some odd years. And here's my take on it. And I think I have a little insight on it. Uh, from the surface, I believe that in, treatments need to be offered. I believe that if treatment is offered early when the signs of mental illness first shows and it's, it's addressed and stayed on top of and still let people lagger and fall through the cracks, just maybe there would be less court cases and less people crying because their loved ones was hurt or was injured or killed because someone of mental illness attacked them. Maybe that needs to be done. Treatment needs to be done early and right away and stayed up on and not let people fall through the crack hole and not be shunned out the door. It's the same. You don't have a mental illness. You're just a bad person and needs to be locked up. Jail is not the only answer. Help treatment, hospitalization, and medication, it plays a big role in preventing this where we are today if it would have been offered sooner. Now, I have a poem that I have adopted, not just for my son, Daryl, but for all the people who suffer from mental illness. And I let this be my theme and some inspiration. And I hope that Daryl will find strength in this poem. I sent it to him. And it's a poem that was written by the late great Maya Angelou. I don't know if you're familiar with her writings, but she was a brilliant poet. And she wrote this poem back in 1969 for a totally um, different reason it was during the racial injustice era and but I believe it applies to those who suffer from mental illness as well it's called caged bird a free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream to the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to touch the sky but a caged bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied and he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with fearful thrill of things unknown but long for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breed and the trade winds that when soft winds with soft signs through the trees and the fat worms waiting on the dawn's bright lawn and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on the nightmare scream. Their wings are clipped. Their feet are tied. They open their mouths to sing. The caged bird sings a fearful thrill of things unknown, but long for still. And his tune is heard on a distant hill. The caged bird sings of freedom. Everyone who suffers 
from mental illness is caged. They all they want is to be free of their illness and become mentally well. I believe as society, we have an obligation to help those become mentally well with treatment, medication, hospitalization, or sent to an institution where they can get the intense help. And if they have to stay for the rest of their lives away from society, at least they are getting the help they need to become mentally well. We are our brother's keepers. And I also want to say to the families who lost loved ones that I, and those who suffered injuries, that I know their pain and I pray that the Lord would continue to comfort and heal each of them. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Ms. Woods. And I should have said this earlier. Um, I have three monitors in front of me and the monitor that I'm pointing at right now is the monitor that the Zoom shows up. So that's why I look like yes, I'm turned away, but I'm actually watching you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, thank you. Um, I thank think... you. Then I'll turn next to uh, Mary Edwards. If you want to turn your camera on and unmute, and then Ms. Woods, if you yes, would. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. And I should say for the record that uh, obviously Don Woods was the first speaker and I have Mary Edwards. If you can let me know who's next to you, please. Oh, there's no one next to me at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Are we good who's, to go? I need to know who's in the room with you because I saw them. Oh, that, oh that's my mm -hmm. husband. Okay. Okay. He's not in the room at the moment. Well, all right. That's okay. He's not here. I just wanted can, to know I saw problem someone. problem with him there. being here? No, he can be there since I know who it is. Okay. Um, we'll just... All right, it's, it's not my husband is here. Will he be okay. speaking or just you? No. No, he's not speaking. All right, go ahead. Thank you for being here today. And again, if I look like I'm uh, looking to the side, it's because that's where the monitor that I can see you okay. is located. So go Thank ahead. You. Thank you, Judge. For the record, uh, my name is Dr. Mary Darlene Edwards, and I am not the wicked grandmother of the West. I am the grandmother of Daryl Edward Brooks Jr. And I asked uh, to be here today for two reasons. First of all, from the bottom of my heart, I want to offer my sincere apologies to those who have been hurt so badly by what has happened here, this um, tragedy that has been caused by my grandson. I want to also apologize to the family of the little boy. I understand their name is Sparks. And to all of those whose lives have been damaged by this overwhelming tragedy. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want to give the family and those who've been hurt so badly the scripture, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And I say this, please know that it's my prayer that my grandson will sincerely and humbly apologize and ask all of you and God for forgiveness for this horrible, terrible deed. Some of you have said that you will never forgive him. Please do not be like the man who drank the poison and hoped his enemy would die. Unforgiveness is a terrible disease, just like mental illness is. Truly, there have been many losses because of this tragedy. Daryl's mother has lost a son. I've lost a grandson. Daryl's children have lost a father and Daryl has lost his mind and his life in the outside world. 
Daryl's behavior, including his voice, should give the, get the attention of the powers that be both near and far. Daryl has uh, suffered from bipolar since the age of 12. And it was that disorder that caused him to drive through that crowd. It is my prayer that he will be treated for this illness and managed in a facility that addresses mental health concerns. We must start with a younger generation. Finally, I'm 80 years old and I have been an ordained minister for the gospel of Jesus Christ for 47 of these 80 years. If you look at my background, you will see that God has used my life to bring about positive change in multitudes of residents in the city of Detroit and beyond. I share this information not to boast, that is not my intention, but rather to let you know that I care about people and their well being. I've spent more than half of my life helping what the Bible calls the least of these, AKA society's rejects. Since this tragedy, I have become a mental health coach. This will help me better understand this horrible disease, which has plagued my family for generations. Presently, there is a church in Detroit that is planning to establish a mental health clinic on the east side of Detroit. Without hesitation, I will support this effort and do everything I can to help those struggling with mental illness. Before I close, I just want to share with you some facts with regard to mental illness. And I got this from uh, the government's uh, mental health website. There's a myth that said mental health problems don't affect me. Many people don't feel like it affects them. That's a myth. It affects everyone. It's a common problem. In 2020, and listen to this, one in five American adults experience a mental health issue. One in six young people experience a major depression episode. One in 20 Americans lived with a serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disease, or major depression. Suicide is a leading, leading cause of death in the United States. In fact, it was the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 24. It accounted for the loss of more than 45,979 Americans in 2020. That's nearly double the number of lives lost to homicide. As a result of this great tragedy, I'm dedicated to leading the next, living the next chapter of my life with a mental health awareness campaign. I have faith to believe that God will hear the voices of all of those impacted by this horrible disease, as well as the cries of the mentally ill. I thank you for this opportunity to share with you from the bottom of my heart, and my prayers will continue on for those who have been affected. God bless you all. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Is there anyone else on the Zoom, Madam Clerk? No, but I reached out to Zach and he has not heard from anyone either. All right, Mr. Brooks, we do not have anyone else. Michelle oh, we have Michelle Allworth. Yes, Sorry about that. Michelle. Thank you, thank you. All right, if Ms. Allworth then would start her camera and unmute and we'll hear from her next. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And you Hi, are- Hi, my name is Michelle Allworth. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, go ahead. I'm kind please. of sick, my son. My son is here in the room with me. He's sick at from home from school. That's okay. Go my ahead. Name is Michelle. My name is Michelle Allworth. I met Daryl Brooks Jr. 17 years ago when we both lived in Sparks, Nevada. He became my best friend, and over time, we became brother and sister to each other. 
We shared so many good times, whether it was hanging out at the house, listening to music, movies, or just having conversations, a good laugh. He always had a smile on his face and the best laughs and jokes. Going out to theaters and a movie, going out to eat, attending Hot August Nights, which is a car show in Reno, Nevada, the rib cook-off. He shared with me multiple times on a daily basis since this, since this has happened last year, how remorseful he truly is. Sorry. Um, he is a very private person when it comes to his feelings and emotions. And it only happens with family and close friends. They say blood is thicker than water. Well, you can choose to make your own family. I've chosen to make Daryl part of my family. I will always have his back, even with his tragic event. Um, I suffer from um, medical issues as well. I have epilepsy and cerebral palsy. My whole life, I've had it my whole life. Daryl was there several times, several times that I had seizures. He called 911, went to the ER with me, stayed with me by my side when I went home, um, and helped in any way that he could help me. Um, sorry. Because of this reason and him being a family friend to me, he lived with me back in 2006 and again in two, either 2013 or 14. I'm glad he lived with me at those times because I black out during a seizure and unable to call 911. He lived with me for over a year. I wouldn't have let him had I not trusted him with my life. He had never shown any signs being this way on what happened November 21st, 2021. This is not the Daryl I know. He is a loving, compassionate, loyal, and humble, per humble person. He would give a complete stranger that needed it, the shirt off his back, the last dollar in his pocket, or a place to stay. During this manic episode, he had blacked out the whole incident. I have prayed a lot since 2016 because of my medical issues and almost lose my life to a seizure, and even more now since this has all happened. I know what happened with those lives being lost and people being injured is terrible, it's something Daryl will have to live with the rest for the rest of his life and always carry that with him, knowing this happened. I hope that I hope that he gets the help he needs for his mental illness. My hope as well is that he gets help in a mental facility. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Thank you. All right, at this time, Madam Clerk, has anyone else joined the Zoom? All right, then at this time, the court will close the Zoom. The proceedings are being live streamed and family and friends can watch that way as well. Mr. Brooks, I'll turn it over to you then. This is your opportunity to address the court. What, if anything, would you like to say, sir? Yeah, I do have a, a lot to say. I would like to stand up if I may. Um, it's emotional. I, I apologize for taking so long. Uh, I want to start first. Um, by giving glory to, to God. I believe in Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he was sent here by the Father to die for all of our sins, everybody. Everybody in this courtroom today Everyone walking this planet, mostly for those of us who will believe. I believe that he was crucified on the cross at Calvary. 
and he shed his blood on that cross that he died that he was buried and that he rose again after three days to glory took his glorious place at the right hand of the father the bible says that he was exalted given the name that is above all names so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father and it's not just something that I was taught by my family it's something I believe in my heart I just want to clarify one thing. A lot of uh, references was made to one of the things I said regarding my conscience being clear. And having the time to think about it last night and to understand um, that the victims have the, the right to feel how they want to feel. They have the right to their opinions and understanding that there's a lot of emotion, pain, frustration, anger, hatred, a lot of a lot of emotions but I don't want that comment to be twisted I don't want that comment to become another narrative that's ran with and taken out of context that comment was made is because I made the decision to rededicate my life to Christ when this tragedy happened. In no way did that comment refer to uh, not having any remorse, not having uh, any understanding it was strictly made to that point that I have repented that I have asked God for forgiveness that I have sent many prayers up learning how to um, wrap my head around this whole situation has been extremely hard extremely hard you get minimal time to um, reflect in in a place like this But one of those minimal times that you get to reflect in a place like this is when you're alone in your cell. When it's just you in the walls. One of the victims made a comment um, about trying to understand why this happened that's a question I struggle with myself the why the how
how could life ever get this far away from what it should be? Regardless of what a lot of people may think about me, about who I am, about my family, about my beliefs. I know who I am. God knows who I am. And I don't have any uh, words of anger, uh, any, any um, shots, so to speak, to throw back. Uh, as I said before, I had to look inside myself and understand why the comments were being made. Why people feel the way they feel and they have the right to. If I may, if I may. I'm going to need to see the turn forward, sir. I don't know that they're ready for that yet. Respect. I think it's important uh, to state why I did want to turn. Um, comment was made about this mask. It's something that. I've worn the whole year of this incident. Um, I don't. Well, I'm not gonna say. I'm not gonna say don't. But I don't feel like um, I needed to go in too wild. Chose to wear this. Um, there are a lot of different reasons why. Um, but it definitely has nothing to do with hiding anything. Um, there is nothing to hide. When you're on TV every day When your life is being dissected for the world to see, when your family's on TV every day in some capacity, um, when you're on pretty much every social media platform, what is there to hide from? I want each and every victim in this incident, family members, those who lost loved ones, those who are still healing. I want you to know that no matter how you felt during this this year, uh, no matter how you felt yesterday. I want everyone to know, also the community of Waukesha, I want you to know that not only am I sorry for what happened, I'm sorry that you could not see <coughs> what's truly in my heart. That you cannot see the remorse that I have. That you cannot listen to all the phone calls that I've made to my family. 
that you cannot hear all the prayers that I've said in my cell, that you cannot count all the tears that I've dropped in this year. The truth is hard a lot of times. Um, I'm not a very old uh, by age standards, but I've, I've been alive long enough to understand that a lot of people are comfortable with hearing what they want to hear, being told what they wanted, what they want to be told. And being okay with that. It's easy to accept what's on the surface. It's easy to accept what's being put out there. It's harder to pull back the veil. It's harder to... look deeper than the surface. And regardless to the truth, I understand that there are many people that would never forgive what happened. I have to be okay with that. And I hold no ill will towards them for that. I have to be okay with the fact that people will be angry, some for a long time, some forever. Uh, I think it was clear um, with respects to how I'm viewed. I will not respond to those comments in anger either. I want to also say that It is not me that can take any pain away, replace what was lost. Give back joy, happiness. There's so many other things that was lost that day. I think all that comes with belief in Christ. I believe that all that comes with time. It's a process. It's a process that we all have to go through. I noticed a lot of things that uh, that I've said over the duration of this trial were um, there's a lot of misconception. I don't consider myself to be a man of God yet is something that I'm learning 
with time, with faith, with study. Lord willing, I will make it to that point at God's appointed time. Something that I'm learning. For anyone that doesn't think that I've spent time in the scriptures even before this, you're mistaken. Passages were quoted from Romans 6.23 in particular. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That's Romans six twenty three. It's a verse I'm very familiar with, and I've read numerous times. Countless other passages are are all passages that I'm familiar with. But think about scripture is not only studying and reading it; it's about applying it to your life, applying it. It's not about just reading it or being able to quote it. It's about living it. At times during this, uh, doing all, doing all these proceedings, um, mostly trial. I've become frustrated at times. Um, I want you, Your Honor, to know, I want the entire court to know that regardless to what you may think about those particular incidents they were not personal being here throughout this year and the the constant um, learning how to deal with everything learning how to um uh, Take everything in. Um, what you see, what you hear, um, things being shouted at you, uh, uh, the threats, and you know everything that you have to deal with just being here. It was like a culmination. Sometimes you get so frustrated. Because you feel like your hands are tied. You, you don't know what to do. And for a person like me, it's easy for me to get to that point. And so it would come out in frustration. I take responsibility for that and apologize to you, Your Honor, and the court. Nothing about it was personal. It was a part of me that felt that I haven't been able to defend myself. And, and, and I, I think it was just the pot boiling over. I was wrong for not being able to control myself the times that I wasn't me. For 
long as I can remember. I've dealt with a lot of issues. And going back to what I said a little bit earlier about what people see on the surface. A lot of people don't understand what it is to battle mental health issues. Not just that, but the difficulties of life in general. <clears throat> the childhood I had not having a father, having to see my mom sometimes work two and three jobs just to be able to support us. I remember being a child and me and my sister, my mom only had two children. My sister's passed away but I remember being a child and me and my sister and my mom standing in the welfare line to get milk to get cheese bread spam and when you're a kid you don't understand that you, you think it's normal I remember living in apartment buildings infested with rodents and bugs. Pouring in cereal in your bowl and having bugs in it. A lot of people weren't raised like that. So it would be hard for them to pull back that veil and understand that. Physical abuse. By the people that are supposed to love you. trying to understand why your mind thinks the way it does why you don't comprehend certain things why no one can provide the answers that you that you want fact of the matter is I have at times been medicated I have been in, in, in mental health facilities only for a short time I can honestly say that life was better. It helped. I think when you're going through something, 
mentally that you don't understand. It, it always helps when you have people not so much that can relate um, <coughs> that also helps but it's it's more it's not the relating part of it it's more of the that you can feel comfortable being yourself with someone to listen someone to <coughs> to tell you that hey it, it, it's all right you can't let your guard down. It's a lot. a lot and back to what I said about truth people are going to like I said um, believe what they want and that's okay This needs to be said. What happened on November 21st, 2021 was not, not, not an attack. It was not planned, plotted. When you constantly hear that, perpetuated, constantly pushed, constantly pushed, constantly pushed, wonder why why this was not an attack this was not an intentional act No matter how many times you say it over and over, it was not. I have a lot of, and this has nothing to do with um, the victims, the families of the victims. And as a matter of fact, I'm grateful that they had the opportunity to voice their opinions and their, their frustrations and, and their angers because I believe and, and hopefully that that will alleviate some of the wounds. I could, I could never point the finger at them and say they're wrong for what they said, their opinions, how they feel, never. And I won't do it. I won't do it now and I won't do it ever. They're well within their rights 
to feel how they feel. I felt a lot of frustration and anger yesterday, not towards any of the victims. It was towards Miss Susan L. Opper. And I won't even throw shots back at her. Again, I choose to take the high road. In spite of the clear language that was used by her, not going to fire back. I'm not going to do that. Am I angry? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. But so what? When it boils down to it, the whole prosecution team had a job to do. Can't be mad at somebody for doing their job. Attorney Basie, Attorney Wichild, I, I respect you guys. Regardless of what you may feel about me, I respect you guys. I really do. I respect you too, Attorney Opera. The difference between the all you all you guys is you attorney opera, I don't respect how you did your job. And I never will. But I refuse to get in the name calling. I refuse to raise my voice. I refuse to do any of that. And I realized that last night. The part of me that I don't understand why it goes the way it goes had every intention to come in here and, 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 and lay into you. Out of frustration and out of the fact of feeling that I needed to defend myself by some of the things you said. How you had the audacity to speak on situations that had nothing to do with this tragedy, as if you were there, as if you had intimate details, as if you knew everything that led up to those allegations. Just by reading the police report. I think every situation is unique in its own way. It all has different circumstances that that leads to ultimately what ends up happening. Reading the police report doesn't give you the right to pass judgment on a situation that frankly is none of your concern. I 
honestly, you would think for someone that's been doing your job as long as you have, you would think you would understand that. You would think that you have some kind of in integrity. Even with that, not gonna bash, not gonna say anything disrespectful, not gonna call you anything other than your God given name. the integrity though I won't ever be able to wrap my head around um, Why you did things the way you did it <clears throat> made reference to this being an open and shut clay open and shut case yet you needed a whole team to prosecute an open and shut case as you say and again no disrespect to Attorney Daisy, Attorney Witchow. <clears throat> I feel like they was the reasons why your case had any strong points, not from you. Thirty-one years, you said. Well, well, yeah, you did say thirty-one years that you've um, you've done this. Thirty-one years. I don't believe you're that bright. Yet, I respect you having the resolve to take on something of this magnitude uh, for this community. Can't do nothing but respect that. Regardless, when I leave this courtroom, I will have no ill feelings with anyone. I know this is uh, being um, live streamed. Uh, 
I believe even in other countries. I, I've gotten some mail from Germany, Belgium. Uh, a lot of it hate mail, um, which which doesn't. I stopped reading it months ago, um, so it doesn't really affect me. It's irrelevant. Um, I do want to say something to uh, everybody watching. As as far as um, those who take the time spend the energy and money to to write and spew hate not just against uh, myself but my family my children um, I have no value in anything that you say it doesn't bother me it doesn't affect me keep up the bad work to everyone else the um, the people that have sent letters of support I, I thank you for that because it's not an easy thing to show love and support to someone who's the most hated man on the planet at this point right now in time. It's not easy. It takes a lot of courage to 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 do that. And I, I, I thank you for that. Um, my family thanks you for that. I want to say to the mother of my children, <coughs> the mothers, excuse me, of my children, um, obviously I think it, I think I should start with the obvious, Erica Patterson. I want you to know if you're watching, I always have love for you. You're, you're one of the mothers of my children. I can never hate you. I, I refuse to go that route. <clears throat> always have love for you. I always respect you. We, we, we got a beautiful daughter. I haven't always been right in the things that I've said things I've done in regards to you what I will say is it always takes two I pray that at some point, uh, you will reconcile with your children and that you remember who I am here in my heart, that you remember that. Uh, my oldest son, who's, who's an adult, his mother, beautiful, beautiful spirit. I thank her for the times that she was there to listen when no one else was, when I couldn't figure out what the heck was going on in life. And I was being pulled to this direction or that direction. And just just couldn't figure things out. She would take the time to sit and listen. And I thank her for it. Uh, times where I had nowhere to go. She would find me in the back of a, 
abandoned cars or trucks or or something of that nature and, and, and she would do things to help you know you, it's a lot of people a lot of good people out there in the world still <coughs> she's one of them I, I thank you Angel um, that's her name too by the way Angel When I was all over the place mentally, couldn't sit still, couldn't make decisions, trying to figure out um, how life would go being young, young parents, uh, the both of us. She never once judged me. She never once ridiculed me and downed me because of my issues. She always was willing to be there. Uh, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that. Uh, for Jessica, my youngest daughter's mom. I believe it's a reason why God puts anyone in your life at the time that he does. It came into my life at a time where everything was chaotic. I didn't have a clue how to even begin to put one foot in front of the other. You came into my life at a time where I was pondering, what did I even have to live for? And in the midst of that, you gave me my daughter, my baby girl. I always get emotional talking about her in particular. Because she's such a daddy's girl. We're very, very close. Very close. felt like uh, when Missy was born, that was God giving me a chance to make good on the mistakes I made with my other older two children at the time. I felt like that was redemption. Everything that I didn't do right before I had the chance to right that wrong. She's probably the single-handed reason why I'm even still breathing. She's such a light, such a light in my life, such a light. She doesn't even 
understand the extent of everything that's, that's going on. She doesn't know what it is not to be able to talk to me when she wants to. To be able to see me when she wants to. She, she just doesn't get it. And I know that. And I'm mindful that there are people in this community that feel the same exact way. lights in their in their life that were taken. So without uh, being insensitive to that I'll move past that. I just want to tell my baby girl that I love her. I love you, Missy. My baby boy. I was born in June during the time that I've been here. His mother, Quita. I regret not being able to be there for the times that both of them needed me the most. It's not an easy thing for a, a, a woman to go to through a pregnancy with virtually no help. Having to move uh, residencies uh, because of this tragedy not feeling safe while while she was pregnant, not feeling safe, receiving threats, things like that. And I wasn't there. I know what it's like to be at the birth of, uh, of, of your children and to see them born and cut the umbilical cord and to do all those things. I've done that. And to not be able to do it for her and for him. To only know what he looks like because of pictures. Um, for her um, to not feel safe to be in the city or um, be around my family members to to build that rapport 
because she can't mentally deal with everything that that comes with. And for me to not be able to help her, for me to not have any words uh, to uplift her, Her expressing her anger to me not knowing how, how everything would go it's hurtful I just I, I want her to know I believe God has a plan for everything and it's about doing the best you can inside of God's will. Say what you want about me. I'm not going to walk away from my children. I refuse to walk away from my children. I love all four of you. I won't stop for nothing, no matter what. A lot of reference uh, yesterday was made about death. reference to um, opinions opinions towards myself I do not fear death not one bit I do not fear death because I'm in Christ Whether we believe it or not, at some point, we all have a date. Everyone on this planet has a date. In the word, it says that is appointed to man once to die. The way I see it, it's inevitable, so why fear it? I'm a million percent confident in where I'm going when this is all over. A million percent confident. Regardless of what anyone thinks or says, I'm a million percent confident in where, I, where I'm going. We 
all got to stand before the judgment seat of Christ at some point. All of us. Nobody's any better than the next person. <clears throat> Contrary to belief, I do not feel like I'm above anyone. I don't feel like I'm superior to anyone. I breathe air, I drink water, I eat, I go to the bathroom, I bleed just like anyone else. I'm no better. I'm a human being, I'm not a monster. human being that's been trying to figure out for 35 years questions that I've never got the answer to noticed yesterday in a lot of uh, the victims statements that a lot of the victims are going through the healing process believe it or not I've prayed for all victims family members for a year now to be able to make it through that process but it is a process it, it won't happen overnight there was a big question of if I was paying attention if, you know, this, that, or the third, which I won't really get into. I definitely was paying attention. And I heard in a lot of those statements, people that were having their own mental health issues. Some recognizing what it was, others not so much. That's what it was. A lot of things that you just can't quite wrap your head around. <laughs> Believe it or not, You were talking to someone that's dealt with those same types of questions for a long time. Questioning life itself. Questioning what's the point of being here to go through all this pain, to go through All the doubts, feelings of inadequacy, I can relate to firsthand. Being made fun of, being joked about, being jeered at, being bullied. Growing up, I can relate to all of that because I've been through it. Not knowing if you even want to 
wake up after you go to sleep. I've been through that. Wondering if you'll even be missed when you're gone. The weirdest hours of the morning just sitting up and just finding something to stare at. Hoping that an answer may just fall out of the sky on you. Me, myself, I've, like I said, raised Christian, but it's been so many times through the years that I've doubted God. It's time, I think everyone in this room can say that, if you believe. You've doubted, you've, you've questioned, you've wondered, Been in situations that just can't figure out why. How 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 do you get? How did I get here? What did I miss? What did what 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 did not catch? What did not see? What? How did it ever get to this? How did it ever end up with this? At some point, we've all, at some point, we've all been in that position. Obviously, in my shoes, it's a little, a little different. said before for the people that don't have any understanding I, I can't sit here and be what people would want me to be we, we're all individuals we all have our own ways of looking at things and uh, we, we, we all have our own uh, personalities or, or, or whatnot that's what makes us unique is our individualism how one person may react to something another person may feel the same exact way but but probably not react the same way People can agree on certain things and, and, and still have a different uh, approach. And listening to all the victims yesterday that that you know had the courage to speak and. And, and, and state their opinions and, and vent their frustrations and their anger and, and and everything. I heard a lot of what should have been done, what could have been done, as far as to the the the, rem the remorse. I apologize for not
showing people what they wanted to see. I just ask that there be understanding to that there's a side out of the courtroom that's not seen. What's seen in the courtroom is just a small a small piece of the whole puzzle. Just just a fraction. The majority of the time I'm not standing in the courtroom or sitting in the courtroom. It's not a day, it's not an hour that goes by that I haven't thought about what's happened. That I haven't tried to wrap my head around how, how something like this could happen. where I haven't thought about the pain that you all are in. What was lost and in the fashion that it was lost. Contrary to what people may think. Get to a point though, and obviously it's different with me being in this position and people being on the on the other side of, of, of the coin, so to speak. It's, it's, it's a different position. On my end, you get to a point to where you just you just tired. You get to a point where you, you you've cried all the tears you can cry. You've prayed all the prayers you can pray. You you never stop praying, but it's repetitive at this point. You get to a point where You're completely drained. You don't know what else you have to give. It was many, many court dates in the beginning of all these proceedings that I wasn't even sure if I can even come in the courtroom without breaking down. It was times where I didn't even feel like I was going to make it through a court proceeding. When I did have representation, it was times where I told my representation, no, I, I, I don't. And that wasn't because I just didn't want to come in the courtroom. It was because mentally I could not handle it. I couldn't. Having to be prepped for, 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 for everything that I was going to walk into. Them, them telling me, you know, it's going to be this kind of atmosphere and expect this and expect this and and it's just like wow <clears throat> how am I going to do this I'm 
I, I, I want everyone to know though, when you walk out of the courtroom and the cameras aren't rolling anymore, you don't have the world looking at you anymore. That's when you can feel like you're human again. When you can go back to your cell, drop your tears, pray, punch your mat if you're frustrated. Sleep it off. Wh whatever you may choose to do. And I wonder how things would be different if the cameras was rolling then. When we remove all this courtroom how would how would it be then? <clears throat> we all done things in our life that we regret, that we're not proud of. That we don't know what we were thinking. That's been like a roller coaster for me in this year, a roller coaster. And obviously, uh, just everyday life, some days are just, are better than others. That's just life in general. Some days are just better than other days. You heard my best friend speak a little bit earlier about I guess it would, would be more happier times but even then Put on a smile to hide the pain. <clears throat> long before November 21st, 2021, long before that day, I was struggling long before feeling dead inside <clears throat> then feeling hopeful then feeling depressed <laughs> then feeling happy then feeling upset just up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Ninety percent of the time, not even knowing why you're going from point A to B. Why is it going like this? So I think you. Do a lot of things to numb that. Some people have different things that help them numb it. Some people turn to drugs. Some people turn to alcohol. Some people turn to many different things. Some people isolate themselves. Some people 
However, however you deal with it, it's how you deal with it. At that point in my life, I chose to put up a front. No one seen me for how I truly felt, then it would be no questions. You see someone and they always have an upbeat appearance or seem to be smiling or seem to be in a joyful mood. There's no reason to quit. Like, what, what, what is their question? How much turmoil could it be? The first thing they would say is every time I see them, they're okay. It's not okay. It's not. But I do believe one thing, though. As long as you have breath in your body, no matter what you're going through, where you may be, what struggles you have, um, what you can't figure out, have to find a way to press forward. You have to keep faith and you have you have to press forward. I think uh the apostle Paul said it best. Pastor Paul said it best when he said, uh, one thing I do, forgetting what's behind me and straining toward the upper call of which Christ has taken a hold of him. Straining for it, which Acknowledging that it's difficult. Acknowledging that there'll be opposition, there'll be hurdles to jump, there'll be mountains to climb. It's not gonna be easy. Acknowledging that by saying straining. Straining to move forward. That's what I've been learning. Is it frustrating that sometimes people mistake that for not caring? Yeah. Very frustrating. As hard as it is, you cannot turn back the hands of time. You can't. As much as I wish I had the power to do that, I can't. <clears throat> so I have to look at life going forward, not backward. I have to look at reality.
I've moved past the actual tragedy of the day of November 21st, 2021, but I have not moved past uplifting this community in prayer, and I will continue to do that until it's my time to pass on. I won't stop uplifting the communities in prayer, the victims, the families. Regardless of how anyone feels, I will continue to pray for them because that's what I want my heart to reflect. And I don't want I don't want it to be uh, misinterpreted what I'm saying by that, by saying I've moved past the actual day. To clarify that so there's no misconception is that none of us can go back and change what happened we can't but that doesn't mean that My life has to continue to be defined by that. I refuse to continue to live at that time because that time is past. We can always say shoulda, coulda, woulda. Nobody knows what they'll do until they're in that situation. It, it, it's easy to say, I would have did this. I could have did this. I should have did this. I would have did that. I would, you never know what you're going to do until you actually there. Does anyone think I haven't asked myself that? Man, I should have. Why did not? What, what, what does it matter now? How many times can I pound my fist against something and say, why, how, how could this, what, wait. <gasps> how many times before you just like, you have to move forward. Forgiveness. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, forgiveness. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their sins your father will not forgive your sins that's Jesus himself God himself I point no fingers towards anyone in judgment to say, how could you say this and how, like I said before, how people process this tragedy is, is how they choose to. I could jump up and down and yell and scream about what was said in regards to me. But why? Everyone has to make their own peace with God. And that's what I've done. 
regardless to what people think I've done it. I don't want that to be confused with being at peace. It's a process, but I've made my peace. That is the only reason why I made the comment that I have a clear conscience. It was not. Pertaining to remorse, it wasn't uh, mockery. It wasn't it? Wasn't to thumb my nose at anyone? That wasn't what that comment was about. I've chosen to do that because it was needed. It's easy to lose your way in a world because the, the world is, as we all know, it's, it's a big place. All types of things are out there. All types of easy to get caught up in, in, in the world. I can't and I refuse to live the rest of my life trying to please other people. I still have a long way to go to get to where I need to be. But my life now is about pleasing God. It's about what he wants, not what I want. It's about what he wants, not what everybody else wants. I brought up God's will Yet another comment that was taken out of context. A comment that again was not meant in a disrespectful manner in any way. It was not meant to thumb my nose at anyone in any way. It was the acknowledgement that God is in control of everything. Everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He is in control. That's what that was pointed towards. That and that alone. For those of us who do believe, we've always been taught that God his way is not ours. <clears throat> what he sees fit to do, we can't stand in the way of it. No matter how much we wish we could, we can't. Frankly, sometimes that sucks. I never thought I would be standing here not being able to
enjoy a time with my family that anyone would enjoy with their family. People lost loved ones. I'm sure they feel the same way. They never expected to be here now because of something like this. That is not lost on me. To suggest that I don't care out of everything that's been said during this whole year that's probably the hardest one to digest To suggest that I'm heartless. Sister Brooks, what do you think this court should do? As far as the sentences are concerned with all of these convictions. Honestly, Your Honor, and I don't want I don't want this to be taken out of context. believe there's issues with me attempting to answer that and here's why I'm still confused I'm still confused on the true nature and cause of the charges I don't understand them I also I also believe the decision was already made before we even got here. And I could be wrong. That That's not a shot. It's not a slight in any way towards your honor. It, it's not. And I don't, I don't want that to be taken out of context as, as well. I, I will say We'll say help is needed. <clears throat> when you've dealt with certain things as long as as I have, We have so many questions about where to start. Where to start. We have so many questions about what can give you the help you need. Who can point you in the direction to get the help you need. There's so many things that 
you, you, you just, you don't know where to start at. Your Honor, I think that throughout these um, uh, proceedings, um, and I've noticed this, that, that you've been very observant. You've, you've been um, very attentive um, but regardless of me being uh, frustrated with some of the things that has, has been you, I, I can't do anything but Look at what what you have what you have done, which is uh, you have you you have um, been very very keen. Um, I believe that um, still a lot of issues there <clears throat> um, I believe that because of the issues I have sometimes you, I may have said things that you probably didn't really understand what I was meaning by it uh, I'm not uh sharpest knife in the drawer um, I think sometimes uh, my, my, my mind probably works a little faster than I can articulate something or pronounce something or say something um, obviously it would be hard to top what was already said said about you uh, thus far um, you, you've gotten a, a, a incredible amount a, a cre cre a credible amount of uh, of love um, for your job in this in this in this matter some even say superhero. Um, some people, I'm sure you know this, but uh, some people have even dressed up as you for Halloween. Mr. Brooks, I'm not looking for accolades from anyone. I'm looking here today to sentence you in this case, and I'm frankly more interested in your thoughts on that than your opinion of me. And how I conducted myself during this trial. Uh, was it my opinion on that part? I, I just. I have a job to do today. It's not an easy one. There are 76 counts. <coughs> I'd like you, if you can and if you want, to tell me how you think I should do that. That's what the victims have stated, that's what the state. Right, they provided their recommendation. The only thing I can say <coughs> is one thing that should be taken into account is the time that I've served. Been here a year. Um, that would pretty much negate count 76. So there's that.
Your Honor, I'm I'm confused. I don't I don't understand the true nature and cause of the charges. So I can't I, I don't I can't really consent to being sentenced when I'm still trying to I don't have I don't understand. It's not a delay tactic. It's not attempting to be disruptive. Um, it's not intended to stop the proceedings. It's my honest opinion. I, I have trouble um, <clears throat> with comprehension. I can say uh, with one million percent certainty um, that everything um, as far as um, in regards to me, everything should be looked at in, 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 in its um, totality. Um, the mental health issues, I believe, that you've seen you've seen them rear their head at times. <coughs> I believe that I, I know that you've seen that rear his head at times. I also believe that recognize the need for, for, for the help that's needed. You've um, you've seen things as far back as uh, my childhood and I believe that you understand the certain needs that would benefit <clears throat> where to start me myself I don't know there's so many issues that I've been trying to address for a long time A very long time and I don't know where to start I have no idea um, I can tell you that I want to be able to get to a point in my life where I can have The ability to recognize before um, before it happens when something could become out of control um, before um, <clears throat> an outside uh, source can maybe pinpoint it and say maybe something's wrong I, I would want to get to a point where I can be able to recognize the signs on my own. Um, I want to get to a point where I don't have 
uh, a, a mind is jumping back and forth and all over the place and these moves they go from here to here to here to here to here to here to here and then it's like oh I'm cool and then it's here to here to here to here I want to get to a place where I can combat that it's this your honor this this has not been easy and, and not just this but, but life in general it has not been easy it's, it's not easy to wake up every day and try to figure out how to, how to stay grounded or how to stay in a stay in a um, um, I don't want to say a box but to be able to to stay in, 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 in a straight line, to be able to take life as it comes, to, to um, not only be able to cope with things, is, is things are gonna happen, problems happen. Um, life itself isn't easy. I wanna get to a point, Your Honor, where I can be able to say okay it's okay it's okay I can be myself I can say you know what you aren't the only person going through this this doesn't make you uh, any less than anybody else. I wasn't asked to be born this way, Your Honor. I, I wasn't. I was not. I don't understand it. But the fact of the matter is, is, is I want to get to a point of happiness again to be able to be uh, medicated and not care what people think to be able to speak my truth without having to feel ashamed that some people may think of me lesser than a person because I have to be medicated for life or because um, they feel like it's not normal Which lends to the reason why I said not wanting to live to please anyone else anymore. But for me to be okay. Here. Here. For me to be okay. Because I haven't been for a long time. I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired, Your Honor. I'm tired. Some days I don't know what, what's up or down. Some days I, I don't know. I want to know. Mr. Brooks, it's going on two hours. <clears throat> I feel like we're starting to cover the same ground over and over. So I'm going to ask you again, because I'm really interested in your perspective. I want to know as I consider and contemplate and finalize what to do in this case, if there are any sentencing recommendations you have on your own behalf to make at this time? I just want to be helped. I don't. don't want to live with with inside this pain anymore I, I, I know that's probably not the answer you're looking for um, your 
Your Honor. I, I, Really, well, like Let me to. ask it this way, sir. Six of these counts that you have been convicted of are intentional homicide charges. The options for the court are very limited. Life without the possibility of extended supervision. Life with the possibility of extended supervision as early as 20 years, that's the statute, and third, anything in between. And then lastly, related to that, there's an enhancer of five years for each count based upon the jury answering that special verdict question, did you commit the offense of intentional homicide by using a dangerous weapon? Thoughts on that? I, I don't... Do you think you should spend the rest of your life in prison without ever seeing freedom outside bars? That would be extended supervision. Should these counts run consecutive or concurrent? Meaning one after the other or serving them at the same time? What are your thoughts on those things? I didn't understand everything you said, but I did. Um, I, I can't live a million years. I understand so, that. So. I feel like. I should be able to go somewhere where I can be helped, where I can be properly evaluated, where I can be properly medicated. If that is an extended period of a long, long time, at least I know that I'm getting what I need, not not what I want, what I need. At least then I would be able to say, it's okay. You can be you. You can Be grateful for the fact that you have experts, or I, I don't know if that's the right word, but um, you, you have people that know exactly what to do, that recognize exactly what needs to be done and what should be done. To be able to um, like I said be properly uh, medicated which is extremely needed I, I don't know if that answers I'll follow it up again do I what I hear you saying sir is that you don't have a specific recommendation in terms of how long the sentences are, whether they're life, whether they're consecutive, whether they're concurrent, but you're asking me to take into consideration your mental health needs and your desire to get help. Would that be fair? Yes, I would say. Um... And, uh... I think it should be, um, what, 
you said, um, what, what was the term you used? Um, the extended supervision term or consecutive versus concurrent? Yeah, the concurrent. Right, serving sentences at the same time versus consecutive one after the other. serving all together. Um, my main thing is, you know, like I said, re re regardless is to not just be put placed somewhere and just forgotten about. That doesn't help. Obviously, I don't know um, how that all works. Um, but, um, I know that it would greatly benefit me to be able to be somewhere where, um, like I said, I can properly um, evaluate it and medicate it with the things that I need. It, it could be something that I haven't even discovered yet, or not me myself, but it could be something that maybe way near that could have helped me years ago that I probably wouldn't never have known up until this point that could have immensely helped me. I, I, I want the, sir, yeah, I want the, the opportunity. And again, to, I think we're starting to right, repeat yeah. some of these topics that you've covered and I understand what you're saying. I and I want to beat this. I want to beat this. I, I want understand. the opportunity to beat it, to show that it can be beat. At this I don't, time, I don't have to live like, you know. I, I want to show. I want to show that, regardless of, of 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 anything, that there is still hope. I want to be able to show my children that, re regardless, you 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 can be you can you can rise up. You don't have to. So I, you don't. I believe I, I understand and comprehend your desire to have your mental health issues addressed and met. You've stated that multiple times. I understand that. I can certainly address that in my sentencing remarks here today. At this time, um, it's been over two hours. I appreciate all of the words you've said here today and the fact that you've um, you know, made a statement that... Um, I apologize for the length. I didn't even... It's not about... Realize. Time. It's okay. But at this time, I would like to take about a... Just shy of 20-minute break, come back at 3 p.m. and start my portion of this sentencing hearing with my sentencing remarks and the sentence. So at this time, um, we will be in recess until 3 p.m. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. All right, we are back on the record in state versus Brooks. Appearances are as they were before. I want to give you all a little bit of my roadmap for my remarks here today and what will ultimately conclude with the sentencing. I'm going to start with a review, frankly, of Mr. Brooks's NGI plea. Now, I didn't, wasn't going to start out doing that, um, but I feel compelled to make a record of certain things in light of many of the statements that were made here today by Mr. Brooks and his family. Following that, I'm going to talk about the case, the strength of the case, the witnesses and evidence that was presented, uh, and some of the things that really impacted me throughout that time um, and throughout the nearly four weeks of trial. Then I will spend some time talking about the victims, their victim impact statements, and again, things that have stood out here to me. I cannot comment on all of the victim statements that have been made, um, but there are a few that I do want to highlight. And then ultimately, um, go through the sentencing factors. Because all of these things that I'm going to talk about relate to those factors, which in Wisconsin there are three primary factors, the seriousness of the offense, the need to protect the public, and the character and rehabilitative needs of the defendant. So I want to start sort of near the end of all of the remarks over the last couple of days, and that is with my thoughts on Mr. Brooks and his mental health. I'm not here to debate that you have had a history over time of intersecting with the mental health agencies and that you may have in your history trauma, um, emotional pain, and things of that nature. Um, I have read through not one, not two, not three, but four reports from experts, people who are well known in this field of what we call forensic psychology and psychiatry, individuals who have an expertise in evaluating a plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. Because I don't want there to be any doubt in my sentencing here today that I've considered that. But I also don't want there to be any doubt that somehow this trial was missing something. Because the fact is Mr. Brooks entered a special plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect uh, in the early summer, maybe late spring of this year. And this court ordered three court ordered evaluations and the state retained an expert to also review the issue. Whether the defense team at that point ever hired anyone, uh, I am, they are not required to disclose that, I don't know. But I have four well-known doctors um, who have written this court based upon the orders that were made or the person, one doctor being retained. And these are reports that are thorough uh, one report is 24 pages, another is more of a summary, it's 8 pages, another is 26 pages, and then another is 12. And they look at the discovery information, so police reports, videographic evidence, things of that nature. They have access to any mental health related records from prior stays or things like that. They look at a history, they do they meet with Mr. Brooks. I've referenced this in the past when competency wasn't so much raised by any of the parties here, but during the trial there was, as uh, Attorney Opper uh, wanted to make a record one day of Mr. Brooks's competency. 
And I will restate what I stated at that point. I have absolutely no doubt that Mr. Brooks is competent. I'm obviously well versed in the legal standard, um, but that is not something that this court was frankly ever concerned about at any point in time. I know that his attorneys, when he had attorneys, never raised the issue. Um, and it was really only after the trial began that that issue was raised, I think, by the public based upon what they saw. But Attorney Opper, like myself, had the benefit of having reviewed each and every one of these examinations. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I think it's important because it goes also to Mr. Brooks's character, which is one of the things that this court must consider along with his rehabilitative needs. And I'm going to read parts of these evaluations so that you all understand the information that I have and why it is my opinion that mental health issues did not cause him to do what he did on November 21 of 2021 and frankly did not play a role. That's not to say that he wasn't diagnosed with something. I've referenced this previously, but that's an antisocial personality disorder. And this is what one of the reports has to say. They've looked at uh, one doctor indicated that there was available evidence to sustain a diagnosis of cannabis abuse, intoxication, antisocial personality disorder, adjustment disorder with mixed disturbance of emotions and conduct. And the reports go on to describe what those things are and that they may qualify as an abnormal condition of the mind substantially affecting mental or emotional processes and thus as a mental disease or defect as broadly defined by the Wisconsin jury instructions and that's at least as to the adjustment disorder. Cannabis abuse or intoxication would not. Um, the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, and this is what the doctor said, reflects converging support of an underlying characterological disorder versus a major mental illness. In Mr. Brooks's case, I would note his history of disregarding the rights of others and conforming to societal norms, including in the forms of multiple acts of violence beginning in his youth, contacts with the criminal justice system, lack of remorse as indicated by being indifferent, rationalizing, etc. The doctor goes on that it's her understanding that this characterological condition would not qualify as a mental disease or defect as defined by the applicable statute, which also specifies that mental disease or defect does not include an abnormality manifested only by repeated criminal or otherwise antisocial conduct goes on to talk about her opinion regarding criminal non-responsibility. And the examiner rendered an opinion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty that there was not support for the defendant's special plea, that the facts at hand do not sustain a conclusion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty that because of symptoms of a mental disease or defect, Mr. Brooks was rendered to lack substantial capacity either to appreciate the wrongfulness of the alleged misconduct or conform his conduct to the requirements of the law at the time in question. In arriving at this opinion, the following considerations were significant to this examiner. While acknowledging Mr. Brooks' documented history of episodic contacts with mental health professionals beginning in adolescence, most of the time he has had such contacts or received mental health treatment when in custody. In effect, there is not a sustained, documented history of a diagnosed major mental illness for him predating the alleged offense or otherwise. Looked at a psychiatric review from April of 2010. Uh, at that point, the defendant was determined to have no medically determinable impairment on which to qualify for disability benefits. The consultant who conducted the review noted that Mr. Brooks claimed mental illness was not, quote, well established, quote, that the statements that he made at that point were not deemed credible. They were inconsistent and not verified by treatment providers in the community. 
Factor number two, the defendant's history of violence be beginning years predating the alleged offense is significant. He faced multiple prior domestic related charges. He was not permitted in his mother's home because of the history of violence. To be sure, the magnitude and lethality of Mr. Brooks's violence in the commission of the alleged offenses is more severe than what was previously known. However, the defendant's history of a pattern of violent behavior, coupled with other aspects of his history, and in this and this case, strongly suggests that his mental state, which produced the alleged offenses, was most fundamentally formed and fueled by contributions of his underlying characterological dysfunction, anger and rage born of his conflict with his girlfriend moments before the Christmas parade tragedy. The examiner considered Mr. Brooks's episodic endorsement of auditory hallucinations, including on clinical interview with the undersigned, meaning the examiner, and in a couple of recorded jail phone calls subsequent to his arrest. She said this, I am unaware of any objective corroboration that he presented either in the hours leading up to or following the alleged offenses as internally preoccupied or otherwise exhibiting signs of impaired reality, contact, or behavioral discontrol. To the contrary, the defendant's conduct within hours of the onset and moments following the alleged misconduct was organized, controlled, and purposeful. Moreover, he demonstrated the motivation and capacity to take efforts to evade detection and try to flee the immediate area of the parade carnage. She went on, I have considered the seemingly inexplicable nature and magnitude of the violence and mayhem wrought by the defendant's conduct on the day in question. He has caused six death, deaths, dozens of injuries, and terrorized hundreds of parade participants and thousands of spectators. There is no indication in the extensive compilation of records and other information available that at the time of the alleged misconduct, he lacked substantial capacity to either control or conform his conduct to the requirements of the law, or that his reality contact capacity to appreciate wrongfulness was substantially impaired. In the context of rage born of his conflict and altercation with his former girlfriend turmoil, the defendant was disinclined to control his behavior or attend to its consequences. Notwithstanding the magnitude of the violence in this case, a mental disease or defect is not defined by the unnaturalness or enormity of the act. Moreover, temporary passion or frenzy prompted by revenge hatred, jealousy, envy, or the like does not constitute a mental disease or defect. She goes on to talk about the course of functioning of Mr. Brooks during the day leading up to the alleged offense, uh, does not suggest that he was behavior, behaviorally dysregulated or that his reality contact was impaired. Um, goes on to talk about what he did in the immediate aftermath of the parade, including fleeing the vicinity, um, making efforts to evade detection or responsibility, um, and other things. Went on to discuss other evidence, including uh, the videographic evidence of the ring doorbell and being on the porch where he sought to use the phone, um, he had apparently discarded a couple of small bags, later determined to contain marijuana, and presumably, this is the examiner again, he discarded items to evade responsibility for possessing them. By implication, such conduct strongly suggests his capacity to appreciate wrongfulness was then intact. When responding to law enforcement officials, he followed their commands. He lowered himself to the ground. We saw that on the recording of his arrest when he was taken into custody and detained. None of the behaviors nor verbal remarks at the time of the arrest suggest he was behaviorally dysregulated or that his reality contact was impaired. 
Following his arrest and being taken into custody, he engaged in an informal series of verbal exchanges with authorities. And none of his statements taken at face value suggest he was then actively psychotic or that his behavior controls were substantially impaired. She then goes on to talk about the Mirandai statements. This court personally watched every minute of that interaction with Detective Carpenter and Detective Stern, along with the one from the night before, which was at the hospital within hours. Um, and I would concur with the examiner's conclusions that the contact of context, excuse me, no, sorry, the content of his initial statements to authorities included multiple efforts to deceive or mislead. He changed his story multiple times, including he initially denied being in Waukesha the prior Saturday. He initially asserted he traveled to Waukesha on the day in question in a tan Kia with a friend. He initially asserted his mother did not own a vehicle, though later acknowledged as much, and that he used it from time to time. Other changes in his story over the course of his statements and the nature of them further suggest that he was making active attempts to evade detection or responsibility. By implication, such behavior strongly suggests that his reality contact was then intact. When he was shown photographs of driving in the SUV into the parade route, he indicated it was not him. And this is again the examiner. Uh, I'm sorry, with the police. She's noting the police contact. It was not until Mr. Brooks was in the booking area of the Waukesha County Jail that he displayed some emotion. And this was to, I believe, Detective Stern, where he was where he said, I didn't mean to kill nobody. Such a remark indicates an awareness of the consequences of his actions and runs counter to a conclusion of an exculpatory mental disease or defect. There's other criteria or other factors. I'm not gonna read them all. That was probably one of the more comprehensive explanations of why that examiner uh, did not conclude that there was support for the special plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. All four examiners shared similar uh, observations. Certainly their conclusions were that there was not support for the special plea. Um, they, one examiner uh, talked about, again, conduct after driving through the parade, abandoning the vehicle used in the act, uh, altering his appearance by removing his outer layer of clothing, clothing, altering how he was wearing his hair, and then engaging in further efforts to leave the scene by securing transportation via a ride-sharing application. This particular examiner went on to say, while he essentially, meaning Mr. Brooks, disclaimed any memory of those actions and could therefore not explain them, such behavior strongly suggests an awareness of wrongdoing and a desire to avoid detection. Another examiner had very similar things, antisocial personality disorder with borderline features, talked about the cannabis use disorder and full remission in a controlled environment. What's interesting about this particular report is the description of an antisocial personality disorder. The DSM-5 defines antisocial personality disorder as a pervasive pattern of disregard for a violation of the rights of others occurring since age 15 years, as indicated by three or more of the following. Failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behaviors, as indicated by repeated performing acts that are grounds for arrest. Two, deceitfulness, as indicated by repeated lying, use of aliases, or conning others for personal profit or pleasure. Three, impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. Four, irritability and aggressiveness, as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults. Five, Reckless disregard for safety of self and others. Six, consistent irresponsibility, as indicated by repeated failure to sustain consistent work behavior 
or on our financial obligations. Seven, lack of remorse as indicated by being indifferent to or rationalizing having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another. In addition, the individual is at least 18 years old and there is evidence of a conduct disorder prior to the age of 15. This examiner noted Mr. Brooks meets nearly all of the symptoms described above because he has exhibited a long-term maladaptive pattern of behavior involving a disregard for and violation of the rights of others, beginning in childhood and continuing through adult life. The borderline features reflect a general inability to sustain healthy relationships with others, including his domestically violent relationship with victim PPP. That examiner goes on with further analysis and conclusions, again finding that there is not support. Um, the last examiner, again, made similar conclusions, also diagnosing Mr. Brooks with an antisocial personality disorder. Why is that important? There is no doubt that in our criminal justice system today, we face a crisis of the mentally ill intersecting in our courts. In the last year and a half alone, this court has ordered many competency evaluations, presided over a number of contested competency hearings, and ordered many, many evaluations for the special plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. And the bottom line is for this court, Mr. Brooks does not present as a person who is either not competent or not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. It is frankly heartbreaking to see those individuals who truly suffer from schizophrenia, for example, intersect in our criminal justice system. Sometimes they do unspeakable things. They hurt other people. Um, I'm thinking of one such gentleman who was so schizophrenic and out of control. He couldn't even be kept in the courtroom. He was too loud. He clearly, if you've ever been in the room with someone who is suffering from auditory or visual hallucinations, it is not something you easily forget. It makes an impression, even on someone like myself who's not an MD or a doctorate level psychologist. I've been in the room with an individual who was, uh, when I did defense work, and he was accused of killing someone near and dear to him. It's a very, very different presentation. It's heartbreaking. It's heart-wrenching. Do the mentally ill sometimes commit atrocious crimes? They do. This is not one of those situations. We've heard Mr. Brooks's family talk about mental illness and bipolar. You know, in addition, and before I get to that, I've also had over my 11 years on the bench of coming face to face with evil on occasion. There are many times, many times, good people do bad things, but there are times when evil people do bad things. There is no medication or treatment for a heart that is bent on evil. Child trauma, bipolar, indifference, physical abuse of a child, or even childhood trauma did not cause Daryl Brooks to commit the acts for which he will be sentenced here today. It is very clear to this court that he understands the difference between right and wrong, and that he simply chooses to ignore his conscience. He is fueled by anger and rage. Some people, unfortunately, choose a path of evil, and I think, Mr. Brooks, you are one of those such persons. As a mom, my heart breaks for your family, for your mom, and for your grandmother. The son that she raised, the grandson that your grandmother knew, the hopes and dreams they had for your life, they're gone. 
And I think it's perhaps far easier for them to blame a mental illness than to perhaps come to grips with their son did very, very bad things due to very bad motivations. One of the things ultimately that will happen when you are in prison, sir, is that the Department of Corrections, they are statutorily responsible for your care and your well-being, including your mental health. I do not have any authority to dictate to them where you go or how they treat you. That is far different than when there is support for a plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect because then the court has available what is called um, treatment facilities um, and a commitment to such uh, a treatment facility. That is something that is simply not on the table. And again, for evaluations, not even my own assessment, but for evaluations from licensed professionals say otherwise, even in the face of your family saying that and even in the face of you claiming that. I'm not even here to say that some of those things can't coexist and that you might not have some of your own mental health issues, whether it be bipolar, childhood trauma, or things of that nature. But the bottom line is none of that caused you to do what you did on November 21 of 2021. I want to next turn to the trial in this case. I think it's important that the sentence here today focuses on your conduct on November 21 of 2021 and the moments leading up to that tragic and fateful decision of yours to drive through the Waukesha Christmas Parade, and of course, the moments after. I, of course, through my sentencing remarks and ultimately what I do here today, I can't answer all of the questions. I can't address all of the issues, including the why. Perhaps the one question that will remain unanswered. Why? Why did you barrel down White Rock Avenue? Why did you not stop? Why did you keep going? Many of us in this courtroom sat through the entire trial. And what we learned is that very early on in the afternoon of November 21, starting at around 1 p.m., the police got ready for the parade. The staging area was um, set up, and that was all along White Rock Avenue. Signs were put in place. Ultimately, barricades were put up um, at a number of locations on Main Street and surrounding that. We know because we heard from Sergeant Warner uh, about what he had done. He had, right before the start of the parade, had driven down the parade route. He had, it was on his shoulders, his responsibility to make sure everything was safe and in order. What's important about that staging area, sir, is we know that that is where the altercation with Erica Patterson really came to a head. We all watched that video, multiple videos. And we know that even before that, you appeared angry and upset. Two individuals uh, testified about you being at that mobile gas station, how you turned the wrong way down a one-way street, waved your hands in the air, rolled down your window, either exchanged gestures or words with one of the drivers, perhaps 30 minutes or so before the start of the parade, maybe an hour or so before you drove down the parade route. 
But what's important is the signage. Even you, at one point, I believe when you were talking with Detective Carpenter, noted, um, it was my words, my assessment, it was clear something was going on. I think what you said was a lot of shit was blocked off. You'd driven past those signs on the staging area. The fact remains they were there, sir. And the fact remains is you told Detective Carpenter that. The other, we then heard from The witnesses related to Ms. Patterson, we heard from Corey Runkle, we heard from Erica Patterson herself. My impression, based upon Erica Patterson's testimony, who, by the way, she showed grace and dignity facing you, the man who clearly has no regard for her as a mother of one of your children, as someone you had a, a domestic partnership with and a relationship with at one point. That's not true. We know, and I would say this goes to your character, what was shown through that altercation and going up the hill, following her, slapping her. You know, the rules don't matter to you, not the rules of the road, not the rules established by court orders, not the rules even of decorum and decency. And I'll get to this more fully when I talk about your character. And I know you went hard at Attorney Opper for her bringing these things up, but those are legitimate, lawful sentencing considerations. And when I get to that point, I'll tell you the case law that supports that. Your character, your even your pending cases. I don't need no case law. We know at the time of all of this, right, you were out on bond for two felony cases, one involving a handgun, one involving the same vehicle in Erica Patterson, and one involving ultimately intimidation of Ms. Patterson. We know that you, that on November 20th, and she was very contrite about this, she told you where she was, she, she invited you out there that you had contact with her on the 20th. There was some physical. Mr. Brooks, this is my time. You that's need reason, to not interrupt. That's the reason why the, uh, the charge was dropped. Mr. Brooks, the state you need to stop. said specifically, wrote you, Your Honor, and said that they know it was no incident that day. Mr. And Brooks, now you want to sit up here. Do not interrupt me you, or you will be removed to and, the other And now you want to sit up here. Stop and try to now. And try to add something in that you know for a fact never even happened. You want to sit up Mr. here and Brooks, talk about every who time. has grace and all this. You talking about someone with five kids that don't have custody. You need to stop right them. now, or you will be removed. Remove me then. All right, he will be removed. He cannot simply stay quiet. I don't consent when this to court being sentenced anyway. I don't consent to this. Just like I told you, I don't know the. He'll uh, be in recess until I don't, he's I don't even to the understand the the true nature and cause.
seated, I'd need to first conform, confirm that Mr. Brooks is able to hear and see the court. We do have the audio and visual on. If someone, I can see on the screen, there is a head set on the table should he choose, but I have confirmation that the audio and visual are working in the other courtroom before I continue. Of course, Mr. Brooks does have a right to be present for his sentencing. He's been present all along today up until his uh, disruption. Um, it was very clear to this court that he had absolutely no intention of stopping his tirade I think there's really no other way to describe it. Um, and this court needs to go through its remarks uninterrupted. And given the history in this case, which is well documented, of his disruptions and inability or unwillingness to follow the very simple rules of decorum and courtesy, which include not interrupting the court, um, I felt it important under Illinois versus Allen to remove him from the courtroom. As that is, of course, one of the options, and we have the benefit of the wonderful technology here in this courtroom and the adjoining courtroom, which I believe is the equivalent of being present. At what I will, what I have referred to at times during this trial as the functional equivalent of being present in this very courtroom. But it is important that I go through this without interruption to make the record that I need to make. I'm going to backtrack. No, you're not muted, sir. You're going to listen to me and you're not going to interrupt. So I, I, I want to, I don't want to call it a tangent, but I'm looking for a note that I made. I would like to exercise my right to be present. Then you need to pledge to this court, sir, that you will not interrupt me despite what you may not like me saying. Can you do that? I would like to exercise my right to be present. All right, he's not making that pledge and under Illinois versus Allen unless he makes that pledge he's not coming back into this courtroom you are not all right clearly he's going to keep repeating that statement so I have muted him at this point um, it was my hope that he would honor the simple rule of courtesy and decorum that he show respect to this court to these proceedings and not interrupt and talk over me but that clearly is something he is unwilling or unable to do i'll find my note that i wrote later um, it had to do with frankly what this court has observed as a pattern with mr brooks and that is when testimony or statements by the court or statements by the prosecution team uh, become unfavorable to him he lashes out and he disrupts and that has been borne out time after time after time during this trial so let me go through and pick up where i left off about the trial i'm not going to go through everything in detail but i, I think it's important that i set the stage, right, and the basis for my sentencing. One of the things that I did note regarding Erica Patterson's testimony, because frankly I wasn't sure where Mr. Brooks was going to go with his own defense, based on some of the remarks he made during um, his opening statement, which was actually later, but I guess I'll go back to my review of his um, recorded interview and some of the things that he tried to say, and at least it became apparent ultimately um, with the way he cross-examined witnesses, 
I wasn't sure if he would claim perhaps someone else was in the vehicle, he was afraid of police, um, the tinting of the windows, some of those things. Here's where it frankly doesn't matter, okay? Erica Patterson provided key testimony in this regard that there was no one else in the vehicle with Mr. Brooks. And I'm aware that he wants to come back, but until he writes me a pledge that he will not interrupt me, under Illinois versus Allen, he is not coming back in this courtroom. I'm not. He has forfeited his right to be present during my remarks. And unless he makes that pledge to me in writing, he's not coming back in. One of the things I tried to do in my preparation, and let me tell you, I reviewed all of my notes from this trial. I have, I think, nine notepads. I looked at just a couple of exhibits, but primarily uh, the map, Exhibit 15. I really wanted to determine for myself how long this carnage took. We know the distance, right, um, from at least where he entered. And you know what, Madam Clerk, put my um, screen up, will you? I'm going to put Exhibit 15 up because I think it's worth doing that. All right. We know he entered from White Rock where the first star is on the right side, where it says Fleet One, a marked sedan and marked SUV. Um, and that's where Detective Casey was. And so we know he goes one, two, three blocks before striking anyone. And then it's really about five blocks of what can only be described as chaos and carnage. We know we have from the evidence and the testimony, two different speed calculations. One from Bosco's, that was the surveillance footage, between 33 and 34 and a half miles per hour. And then we have one farther down from the footage from Curry Insurance, where it was an average 32 miles per hour. Now, I acknowledge math is not my strong suit. I did not do a calculation, but I don't think it took very long for all of this to happen. I think it was a matter of minutes. I think five minutes would even be far too long. It's probably three, maybe. And it was somewhat hard to gauge during the trial because of how the state presented, and I don't mean this as a criticism, but they were very meticulous in showing video, breaking it down, showing it at half speed, sometimes 30% speed, to really get an understanding of what was happening. And at no point did anyone ever tell me or tell the jury how long this took. But even though it took just a couple of minutes, there were so many opportunities for Mr. Brooks to simply stop, turn around, turn down other streets, before he ever crossed Barstow Avenue. And what we know is that at 437, Detective Tom Casey had the first police encounter with Daryl Brooks. Came face to face, Detective Casey at the hood of the car, coming eye to eye, that SUV brushed past him. And here's the thing. Detective Casey said he wasn't going very fast. To me, that tells me he had ample time to reflect about what he was about to do. If you look on that map, it's not a pledge. He's not coming in. When you come down White Rock, you can take a hard left on East Main Street. You can take what I call a soft left. I believe it's Pleasant Street. 
And Detective Casey, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I can't see it on the map. Frankly, you can turn around at any point in time on White Rock Avenue. But instead, and I, I think if you all try to picture this, as difficult as it may be, there's squads with lights, there's barricades. I know I read in, a, in the other act's motion that Mr. Brooks claimed at one point he was having a panic attack and he, again, maybe I think he was going to claim at some point he was afraid of police. Why drive toward them? Why take that right-hand turn? There's no reasonable explanation other than he was angry, he was full of rage, and he didn't care who he came in contact with, what he came in contact with, whether he drove past, through, at, he drove. Detective Casey pounded on the hood of that car, saw his face, again, was brushed by that SUV, thankfully not hurt. All of this preceded by the visual signs along White Rock Avenue of the staging of this parade. Floats, bands, banners, signs, people. And as you got closer to Main Street, the spectators lining those streets, which um, both, I believe, Detective Casey and Sergeant Warner said were thousands of people. Before he ever gets to Barstow Avenue, he comes in contact with, after Detective Casey, Officer Buttrin, and Officer Schneider. He has an opportunity, if you look at this map, he could go right on Buckley. Again, there might be police, there might be barricades. You simply stop. You ask, can I get out? No doubt in my mind, any police officer there would have done just that. He could have gone left on Northeast Avenue. Continuing down, he could have gone left on Martin Street. Continuing on, Barstow Avenue. This is where the parade participants, unfortunately, he's, he has contact with them. But he could have gone right on Barstow. He could have gone left on Barstow. And we know from some of the footage that we saw that his car was seen flying past, true not hitting one at this point, but flying past. There's no logical understanding for Mr. Brooks other than he's in the middle of a parade and he's about, he can see them. Anyone driving a vehicle would see what's ahead. And we know from this map, right, what was ahead of him. We saw that video footage. We heard the testimony. Many police vehicles at these intersections with their lights flashing. There's no doubt in my mind that Mr. Brooks would understand a parade was going on. You can turn off my uh, monitor, thank you. We also know it was not yet dark. Dusk, this was from the battalion chief who talked about when he arrived after that first alert at 439, it was not yet dark, it was dusk. I think that aids to the visibility that Mr. Brooks would have seen all of these people. This is not under cover of night. It's of course downtown Waukesha. We saw city lights and many of the street lights I'm referring to in many of the videos as well that would have been on or coming on. We know just past Barstow, he strikes his first victim, Nicole White. She was with Remax Services with the hot air balloon. If anyone's seen that, we saw it in the video, that is unmistakable what that is. That would get anyone's attention. If this was a mistake, if he was lost, this was his very first opportunity to stop and do the right thing after causing injury 
to a person. But he didn't. He did not stop. And then, of course, the Walkers of South Band. It's hard not to think about what I watched and not have this reaction. Those were images that frankly kept me up at night that I saw over and over and over. For their band director, she is a hero to me, to get up on the stand, to talk about, and that was Sarah Waymeyer Arparicio, to identify each one of her students, talk about their formation, talk about what she saw. So strong for all of you. Mr. Brooks had another opportunity to stop. This wasn't one isolated person that he could claim, I didn't know I struck someone. This was driving over people. What Kyle Jewell described as the SUV went over people like they were big old speed bumps. I know the green children were injured around there Thankfully, their physical injuries were minor, and I know I could probably spend a long time talking about the injuries of the band members, and I'm not gonna go through that. They were significant. It was horrific. Thankfully, none of them were killed. And then, of course, moving on to Burr's logistics uh, between the band and the Blazers, that is where Kelly Graybow and her 10-year-old daughter, Adelia, were in that adorable Cindy Lou Who costume. And what struck me, and Kelly referenced this in her statement yesterday, was seeing the tires go past her head after she was hit. Delia had major injuries as well. And then of course, the footage from the Waukesha Blazers. And Jeff Rogers talked both at the trial, he testified, and he gave a statement yesterday about, again, having to come into this courtroom, talk about all of those who were with him, who were injured, and of course, little Jackson Sparks, another video that frankly is very difficult to watch and hard to unsee. You heard not only Jeff, but Josh Craner talk about what happened. And Josh, of course, being struck. And then the extreme dance group. I think it's fair that I didn't fully understand the extent of their injuries until hearing from many of the victims yesterday. I now understand why one of the girls called her aunt and said, my entire team is dead, because that's what it looked like. It was horrific. And to think of those two brave young ladies who got up during this trial to testify about what they saw, what they did, Jamie and Alyssa, your dancers are proud of you. And because of you, justice has been served. We heard from others, spectators, Deborah Ramirez, regarding herself and her son, that the vehicle was accelerating, not stopping. A moment that sticks out to me was really Mr. Brooks trying to chastise her for not seeking medical attention right away. Her response was perfect. She waited due to the number of injured and all the blood she saw. Understandable. 
not something to be chastised for. And then moving on, and again, I know I'm not mentioning everybody. These are just some of the highlights that, and I should call them low lights, not highlights, but some of the testimony and evidence that really, really impacted the court. Stephanie Bonesteel and her husband testified about what Citizens Bank was doing, uh, hearing the impact against Jane, a very large thud and an audible gasp from the crowd. Her husband, Adam, was driving the support vehicle. And when he was being cross-examined about why he didn't see the driver, again, he just simply said, I thought it was my wife that had been hit. All I saw was the red poncho. And the only time we ever heard about brake lights was when Jane Kulik was on that vehicle and he braked so he could get her off the top and run her over. We heard from Matthew Harris who talked about the red SUV coming straight at them and then veering and going in the direction of the dancing grannies. And again, that audible gasp as he described that eerie sound He saw a child injured in front, Jane Kulik behind, actually the child and Jane Kulik behind and two victims ahead. He saw two of the dancing grannies. What he described as the SUV traveling faster than the speed limit. What I wrote down from his testimony is he's a combat vet and this is what he said. I've never saw anything like this in such a safe area. You could tell he felt bad about not seeking treatment right away for his daughter. He talked about how his wife's a nurse practitioner and again he didn't want to direct resources from other victims that we thought she was okay enough to be home with them. Now by this time in the parade it's very clear the spectators are noticing Something is not right. The sounds, the atmosphere has changed. They're screaming, there's gasping. There's a noticeable difference. At this point, I believe that Owen was struck, Kelsey was struck. Probably another miracle given the injuries she sustained, a tear in her spleen, significant road rash cuts, requiring facial surgery. What Mr. Knapp described the driver as having eyes completely wide open. And then next we heard from Laura Thien, one of the dancing grannies. She talked about the sisterhood. Another brave woman came in, talked about what happened to that group. Seven people injured from her group, four fatalities. She said it all happened in a matter of seconds. All I seen was bodies. It looked like a war. The six people who were killed suffered multiple blunt force traumatic injuries, severe, significant, some dying instantly. I was impressed by both Dr. Scheel and Dr. Bizricki, Dr. Bizricki for her attention to detail, her looking at that vehicle, inspecting it, looking at the heights where certain damage was done and it being consistent in height with the individuals that she did the autopsies on. And of course, Dr. Scheel, and both of these individuals have testified before me, but Dr. Scheel, very shaken from the autopsy of little Jackson Sparks.
We then, continuing on, heard from Father Witter, very gracious man. He too talked about how he noticed something unusual, saw an SUV flying down the road, heard thuds. It was faster than anyone in their right mind would be going. He estimated it to be over 25 miles per hour. And then Lucas Hallmark, the off-duty police officer who was walking with his family on that day. He talked about the commotion behind, the large amount of screaming. You could feel it was palpable when he testified about having the wherewithal to try to get his kids out of the way, throwing his three-year-old as far as he could out of the way. You could see the pain on his face when he talked about not being that successful with his seven-year-old. He said, I wasn't quick enough. He testified that he thought this was a terrorist act, that SUV did not stop. I referenced the speed already, the ACE speed estimation from Detective Carpenter, 33 to 34 miles per hour, a little bit more than that. The speed calculation by Michael Smith from State Patrol from farther down the route of averaging 32 miles per hour. And then of course, the vehicle inspection by the state patrol finding no mechanical issues. There was also the Franklin assistant chief who attended the parade. He was near West Main Street in Maple. He provided the testimony regarding the SUV, the window being open, and the driver sticking his head out, looking out. He testified how he thought perhaps it was either a medical emergency, maybe even a mechanical issue, but it was clear once that SUV passed him and he saw that driver, he saw you, Mr. Brooks, no panic, no distress. His heart sank. He knew it was not a medical emergency. The body language just didn't fit. He did not believe it was mechanical at that point either. And then he saw the vehicle crank to the right. As he testified, he seemed excited about what he had done. Another off-duty police officer, this one from Wauwatosa, <clears throat> talked about how he saw Mr. Brooks after the fact, crash the vehicle, hear him yell out an expletive and run southbound. With his sweatshirt still on, we all saw that video. Of course, at one point, Officer Skolton had contact. And as he testified, he put things together. Keep in mind all of the radio traffic, right, about one person, then like 15 people and another 15. It was very apparent to him that although he was on the far end, he was around the dog leg on Wisconsin and Maine, that a vehicle had driven through the parade. He saw this vehicle. Of course, at that point, it was heavily damaged. He made the decision to use deadly force. What did he do after? What did Daryl Brooks do after? We crashed the vehicle. He fled the scene in a hurry. He changed his appearance, took off his sweatshirt, loses his shoes, I think in a hurry to get out of there, not caring that they had fallen off. He puts his hair up. We saw that on a number of videos. He asked unsuspecting people to use their phone to call an Uber. All within minutes of all of this happening. He was in such a hurry to get out of there, he left his phone in the SUV. He calls his mother, who arranges for an Uber. We heard from the Uber driver. He never showed up. It was nearby, ultimately, where he was found. And then, of course, the ring footage of his contact with Daniel Ryder. That is at 5.01 p.m. 
minutes, minutes after all of this happened. Mr. Ryder was astute, noticing that after Mr. Brooks being in his home for maybe eight to nine minutes, he saw squads driving by. I think you could say his gut told him something wasn't right. And he had Mr. Brooks go onto the porch, of course, after having given him a sandwich, given him a coat to wear, ultimately asks him for his coat back, and then of course the arrest. This is where some of the lies become evident. Mr. Brooks claims ultimately when he's being interviewed by Detective Carpenter, um, they have to actually seek medical clearance for him because he claims that he was thrown to the ground when he was arrested. He was not. The video is very clear. He cooperated. He laid down. There was no use of force used at all to take him into custody. But we know ultimately that he lies about what he was doing in Waukesha, where, how he got there, who he was with. He lies about having contact with Erica Patterson the day before. We know when he's found, he has the Ford Key credit card, not only in his name, but one, whether it's a credit card or like a benefits card, but it's in the name of Erica Patterson and of course an ID for himself, a state issued ID. The Ford itself is registered in his mom's name. It's the same address that's on his ID. And there was documentation found in the Ford Escape He's now in custody, he's taken to the substation, ultimately taken to Waukesha Memorial Hospital. What's notable about the video and audio clips that this court reviewed from the hospital, Mr. Brooks is calm, he's coherent. There's no obvious signs of impairment, no obvious signs or really any signs of mental distress. He makes statements that he's not from the area he doesn't appear disoriented or confused. At some point, there's kind of a jovial atmosphere between him and one of the detectives. <clears throat> the next day, he lies to Detective Carpenter, denies driving to Waukesha, I got a ride. He makes up the story about a tan Kia. He's very nondescript and vague with the information that he provides. And over the course of those five hours, he never once references the parade. He never once says there was another driver. Of course, they start talking to him initially about the domestic altercation because by that time, it's very clear a link had been made between Erica Patterson and the call uh, that police originally received of the domestic or at least an altercation near Frame Park and Mr. Brooks. And we also know because of the bond conditions in the two felony cases, he's not supposed to have any contact with her whatsoever, but he does. At no time during the five hours on November 22nd, does he make any admissions? Does he show any concern for any of the victims? No empathy, only lies, only concern for himself, for his family. Can I have a phone call? He does not provide, and I said this already, the name of anyone else that could be driving that vehicle. At one point, Detective Carpenter says, one of two people drove through the Waukesha Christmas Parade. Either a God-fearing person who screwed up or the malicious guy. Daryl Brooks's response is, don't spin it. One of the things that has become abundantly clear throughout this trial, Daryl Brooks understands exactly what he's doing. His comprehension is fine. I have absolutely no concerns and have never had any concerns throughout this case and throughout this trial or even through the past day and a half regarding his competency. 
He's intelligent, he's deliberate, he's purposeful. He made nuanced arguments during this trial, one about the right to counsel versus the right to the assistance of counsel. That's a sophisticated legal argument, not the product of someone who doesn't understand. He asked questions on cross regarding tint, horns. Um, he brought up the recall after the fact. He talked and asked questions about, I should say, question about barricades, police being at the intersection. Although we never fully understood what his defense was, what well, became very apparent to me as I reread through all of my notes is that from the very beginning, he wanted to argue jury nullification. If you go back to his opening statements, he talked about power and the jury doing the right thing. He repeated that theme during his closing statement. At one point, he objected to evidence based upon a violation of one of the court's pretrial rulings. Again, a pretty sophisticated objection that resulted in the court striking an exhibit that had previously been received. Today, he spent close to two hours talking on his own behalf without any notes. He covered a variety of topics. I want to talk next about Here's my note that I found. One more thing on Mr. Brooks. You know, at times, right, we've seen the eye rolling, the fake clapping, the laughing, hand gestures, many times and most times very emotionless, unless he's doing those things, which would be really inappropriate and are inappropriate. His reactions are largely negative when things are not going his way. What did this community suffer as a result of this tragedy, this malicious conduct by Mr. Brooks? Well, I think many of the victims who spoke said it best. Lori Lockett described it as this, a sense of personal safety you robbed from us. I believe it was Bill Mitchell who said, the only life he seems to value is his own. Jason referred to it as evil. And he talked about innocence being stolen. He called the defendant a coward. No remorse. What he said is, you look like a monster. You look disrespectful to court and witnesses. You look like a callous jerk. But I forgive you. Such character, such compassion. Margaret talked about the mental, physical, and emotional toll this has taken. She talked about how it was so tra traumatizing that her mind won't let her see everything that has happened and that she's worried when her mind might allow her to do that. I'm thankful that she's 95% back to normal. She talked about emotionally every day. She's reminded of the physical pain and the loss of self but she's had tremendous support from family and friends and that today she will move on. Jeff Rogers also commented on the lack of remorse and sympathy for the victims, how he has had to relive just the immenseness of this, the confusion, the anxiety, depression, as a father, an irritation. He talked about how his son, Caden, was so concerned for his younger sister. I'm really glad Riley is okay. 
I believe that was from the day of the parade. And how he recognized he was inches away from losing three of his four kids just because of where they were located. He had flashbacks of grabbing his daughter's jacket, missing the first time. But that Riley gets up sometimes six, seven, eight times a night. How this was supposed to be a happy kickoff event for him as their new president. And how after it happened and in the aftermath, the weight of the moment and 35 people there trying to find everyone weighed on him. He talked about the media showing up at his door and the emotional toll things have taken. It was intense and speaking at Jackson's funeral. He talked about how his faith is stronger. Again, very gracious, very inspiring. We heard next from Jessica and Juan and their how this impacted them, the loss of their son, their son's friend Jackson. They were their kids were involved in two different groups that day. One a dance group, not not the extreme dance group, but a different one. And then of course the Blazers. And how I believe it was Jessica who said, I yelled stop. I put my hands out as if I had the power. How she saw Jackson and how she will forever have that image burned in her memory. And that she was so grateful when she found her son, how she covered his eyes to shield him from what was around. Not once, but twice they had to run because at first it was what happened through the parade and then the active shooter uh, situation because of obviously people didn't know who had fired the shots in that moment and she talked about pain and terror. Many people talked about PTSD. I mean, for her, I was really struck by how difficult it has been by, because of what she saw, not able to be a teacher, how she's hypervigilant, and every sound sends her into a panic, how her joy has been stolen, and how she does her best to hold it together for her kids. But when she was alone, she cried, she screamed, and only a month ago was she able to return to work, but in a very different capacity. She commented on the lack of remorse by Mr. Brooks, and that he seems to search only for sympathy for himself. She said it, he will always be a danger to society. We heard from more individuals from the Blazers, again, a lot of discussion of PTSD. The sights and sounds of the SUV plowing through, the impact to her and the kids, the nightmares, how parking lots are problems, there's panic attacks, that no one will ever be the same. Of course, we heard next from the Sparks family. They're hurt, angry, they're traumatized, they're broken. It was difficult to even watch them make their statements. Their hurt is palpable. She talked about her last hug with Jackson. The horrible sounds she heard. She saw a police officer holding Jackson she went to Tucker and that her world came crashing down. She talked about how she found a hat, both boys' hats, then shoes. And I didn't realize how significant Lee Tucker had been injured until she described that for us yesterday. How Tucker... somehow blames himself for his brother's death. It's not your fault, Tucker. 
It's Mr. Brooks's fault. One of the things when there is a fatality with all of these victims is the future that is robbed from them, right? No future weddings, no future graduations, no future grandchildren or children, no plans. It's just gone, it's all memories. And the contrast the contrast with, frankly, what Mr. Brooks will have, and that is even a life in prison, he'll make memories, he'll have phone calls, he'll have visits. He may even get to hug the people that he loves again. For the six individuals who lost their lives, that will never, ever be a reality. And that this family also talked about the lack of empathy, lack of remorse, no apology. I'm aware Mr. Brooks wants to come back. It says, I don't intend to interrupt in any way. That's not a pledge. He needs to pledge that he will not do so. I need that word in that statement. And if he does that, I'll bring him back in. I'm gonna to try to go a little bit faster. Some of the comments. The yells and screams from that night will haunt me for the rest of my life. I'm asking the court to give the max for each conviction because he has given the community a life sentence of these memories. I think it was Tyler's mom who talked about the community rising like a phoenix. You clearly have a phoenix for a son. He's strong. He got me a little bit with his comments. Wasn't expecting that. You're an amazing young man. You're a picture of resiliency. A fortitude of strength. I think what this community needs. I thought it was quite a testament that you took those pictures and the same, um, the same pictures of Jackson, you replicated that and I thought that was a great tribute to him. You talked about, of course, rising up with Eric who had significant injuries as well, both of you, and how you fought back and each were able to play baseball, even if not up to the full capacity that you had done previously. And then we next heard from Sasha, who's haunted by survivor guilt. My heart breaks for her. She talked about feeling empty how she couldn't play soccer because her kicking leg would hurt from the injuries she sustained. She has difficulty sleeping, struggles with nightmares. Physically and emotionally, she feels stuck. She talked about maybe law school being in her future. And to her, I say, don't give him the satisfaction of holding you back. Rely on your friends and your family and be the phoenix that Tyler's mom spoke about. Jen Dunn read a statement from Sasha's mom, and I wrote this down. No one knows what it's like to stand on your feet when there is no floor. That's a pretty powerful image. I think that's very apt for what this community has gone through. We heard from others, including the Teagues. We saw photographs. So many families with more than one individual who was injured. how baseball for Eric was stolen, how he was such a good player.
we heard a lot about night terrors and again PTSD and trauma one of the individuals talked about humor is good medicine and I would echo that we heard about one band member who whose instrument may have very well saved his life someone described it as a mental massacre though the aftermath of this it's difficult to go downtown it's difficult to get restful slumber panic panic attacks are common describe mr brooks as sheer evil in its vilest form i wrote down that despite all of the impact and carnage many people talked about forgiveness brokenness sorrow anger hatred regret a lot of emotions frankly really no emotion shown by mr brooks certainly not for what he did on november 21st we saw a lot of anger for some of the people who lost loved ones and understandably so Many families were devastated. Nannies and grandmas were taken away. Yes, there were very specific terms used to describe Mr. Brooks, that in their opinion, he's a monster, he's a demon. Pure, unrepented evil was one of the phrases that were used talked about the system failing us saw you in your SUV hanging out with a smile of satisfaction on your face for one of Leanna Owens sons I lost my mom I wasn't always a good son you can hear right the regret in that statement because life is short and these lives were taken far too short. We heard the very gracious, gracious statement from Michael Carlson, who unbeknownst to me had been writing Mr. Brooks in jail and share, sharing the gospel and the love of Jesus. He read a poem, which I thought was beautiful from the standpoint of his sister. And he said this in that poem. It says, we both died that day. I, Tamara, died to life. You died to the world. And then, of course, the Sorensen family talked next. They talked about never seeing their Grammy again. You murdered my mom. But at least I have some peace knowing she died doing something she loved. We heard from Brooke yesterday and today. She reread her statement due to the interruption. Proud of her for getting up here and sharing that. We talked about how compassionate each one of these individuals who died were. We heard about the compassion from Detective Casey that we learned about. It said Detective Casey came to our home to verify what we knew and he greeted us every day of this trial. They ended with angels watch over us. Six angels watching over us today. They asked me to hold Mr. Brooks accountable so that he will not have the opportunity to hurt anyone ever again. We heard from the Kulik family about the empty space that they have and the brokenness, their lives being shattered by mom and grandma being taken away. We heard from her youngest daughter among them 
The grief was so palpable, being 17 and in high school as a senior, now a first year in college. She talked about all of the things she will never have with her mom. Just the last year alone, an 18th birthday for her and her brother, graduation and beginning college. She lamented that her mom would never see her do her wedding vows, never see any kids that she would have, be a grandmother. She wouldn't be able to call her mom for parenting advice. And how excruciating it was for that family to wait three hours because of the chaos at the hospital. Talked about triggers of their PTSD, sirens, things of that nature. And how she waited. She waited hoping that Daryl Brooks would have a reason she also said this, no verdicts don't bring my mom back. No more hugs, no more dinners, no more talks. My mom was the glue that kept our family together and we are falling apart. Moving on, Leanne talked about her safety and security being stolen by this defendant. She asked Mr. Brooks to picture his own daughter, unresponsive, lying on the ground with a leg injury, a head injury, and blood coming out of her mouth. She talked about the excruciating two weeks in the hospital, wondering if her daughter would ever live in a wheelchair and then a walker for months. She said this, all you had to do was hit the brakes. Her daughter talked about being scared of everything, worried about a sister, being alone in a church for three hours on lockdown because of what was happening in the aftermath. And we heard next from the Urell family, a family that, of course, was impacted significantly with four of their children, all of their children being struck by the SUV with the mom, of course, having to testify, in this case being called by Mr. Brooks, which, of course, was his right to call witnesses, but it's the manner in which I think the indifference, not caring that this was someone who had four children impacted significantly, but clearly you're raising your kids the right way. The grace and dignity Charlotte got up and talked about. The basic things you learned in kindergarten she described what she saw as being stupid, delusional, and egotistical. She wanted to punch you in the face, and understandably so. I think her words were, your arrogance is pathetic, and her mom echoed those words. And then the gut-wrenching survivor guilt that you heard from her mom she goes, I say this with a heavy heart. I have my kids here. I had to fight for my children. They will strive. And then, of course, we heard from Alyssa, her heart-wrenching statement. She, of course, testified bravely. But you could tell the impact that this had on her and what she saw in the aftermath to the Extreme Dance team how one of the girls who at 10 years old, even lying on the ground, being injured, had the wherewithal to ask, why would someone do this? If a 10 year old knew this, then the defendant knew this. And how she left the hospital not knowing if she would see some of her girls again. She was completely and utterly broken, forever changed by this event. She waited. She talked about how she waited for remorse, for empathy. It didn't happen. Dylan Urell said something very insightful yesterday, something we didn't hear about in the trial, but 
because of where he was at on the parade route, around the corner, waiting for his children. He didn't even know that all of them were in the parade. He said this, you hit the corner, sorry, you hit the brakes to go around the corner. And then you drove through a barricade where an officer shot at you three times. Those brakes were working. You knew how to use them. And you selfishly only use them so as to not crash your own vehicle as you fled the scene. He talked about walking through and around that corner through the wake of carnage, bodies all over, women, adults, children, deceased, people running all over. We heard from more of the members of the extreme dance team, either directly or parents and loved ones how they had to walk through the carnage to find their children. Such a gracious statement of love, talking to Mr. Brooks about being a Christian and how she prays for him. Very powerful. Thank you for that. Her daughter, equally as powerful and brave and gracious. But even she knew, she said, that I thought about you every day. How could someone do this? More victims talking about PTSD. How even the song that was playing during the extreme dance team performance is a trigger for her PTSD. and how she's forgiven him. We heard from the sister of victim HH and how the first thing she talked about was the sound of Vivian Urell whimpering, crying, and then she found her sister, how her clothes were ripped off. She was unconscious, half naked. How she felt forgotten because her mom was at the hospital with her sister, of course, due to the severity of her injuries. How her sister was in a coma for two weeks, but how she has survivor guilt and issues like that, panic attacks, PTSD, she can't be around fireworks, tire screeching is a trigger, that this turned her life upside down. <coughs> And then, of course, we heard from victim H.H. herself. So brave to come here. I'm so very thankful you are recovering. Someone commented on how amazing it is to see the many people with their in recovery. Um, you wouldn't know by looking at them, of course, the emotional and mental injuries are significant and severe, but so grateful frankly, lucky to be alive. I say to you, that scar on your neck should be a sign of strength and fortitude. You fought, you won. You have a story to tell. Don't shy away from it. And of course, we heard from her mother as well. We saw that PowerPoint with the pictures of their journey the road rash on her face was horrific. You can only get a mental picture from words so much, but to see those actual pictures, her int being intubated, and oh, it's heart-wrenching. And all of the surgeries and the toll it took on their family. But she described her daughter as a warrior. I think all of you here are warriors. We heard from Sam and her family and what she went through and how significant her injuries were. And the, her mom talked about the haunting vision she has of just 
what she saw because of her perspective. Sitting in the back of the pickup truck, she had a seat, a front row seat to horror. How she thought her daughter was dead because she was unresponsive and blood and really kind of the chaos and the confusion and not really even being able to articulate what happened over the phone to her husband. She described what happened as careless and reckless. Asking Mr. Brooks, how could you do this? What kind of father does that? The last person we heard from was uh, victim, I think it's GG, the mother of FF. If I have it reversed, please excuse me. And how you could, she, I actually have her written statement that was provided earlier today, but how she was so taken aback by the conduct of Mr. Brooks, that she frankly called him out on it yesterday because he was kind of motioning his hand like, okay, come on, let's get this over with, hurry up. She yelled at him, you don't care. She goes, you hit me, I saw you, you knew. You're a child killer, you're a woman killer. She was so flustered, she had to really gather herself before she could continue. So again, I wanna thank the victims. I have other statements that I've read for people. Um, so gracious, I think they were all members of the Catholic communities. Their statements were translated, very gracious. Praying for Mr. Brooks. So I just wanted you all to know that I've taken all of these statements into consideration uh, today. I can't read your sign, Mr. Brooks. Can you hold it up closer? If it's a pledge that you will not interrupt me, I will bring you in for what will be the final section of my remarks today in the sentencing portion. And I think you should give him that opportunity before you go through the, fa the, uh, the sentencing factors. And I can only read the top where it says objection, but... I can't tell what it is, what it says. He can bring the sign with. We'll clear the courtroom. We'll take a short break, and I will bring him back in. But I will warn you, Mr. Brooks, if there is one interruption, you will go back to that room because you will forfeit your right to be present for the sentencing portion. We'll be in recess until we can get him back in. Thank you.
Thank you. Please be seated. The record should reflect that uh, it's 4.53. Mr. Brooks is back in this courtroom. Mr. Brooks, the only way I will honor that request is if you specifically uh, waive your right to do so. Without that, um, that's not a convenience for you over there. It's You go over there when you frankly demand removal under Illinois versus Allen. I didn't demand anything. No, your conduct did. So you My can conduct sit. conduct didn't demand anything either. All right, Mr. Brooks, please sit changing, down. You keep changing And I'm going to continue with my sentencing remarks. You keep changing the jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, it's a subject matter jurisdiction that has yet to be proven on the record. In Mr. that Brooks, court and in this one. Please sit down. I would like to go back to the other court. It's not a courtesy to you. If you'd like to specifically waive your right to be physically present, then I will entertain that. Otherwise, never, you need to sit down. I never waived, to, I never waived the right to not be present. That's because you to, forfeited your right I to be present by anything, conduct. Your Honor, You're now wrote, back in this courtroom. Your Honor, I wrote three. I did what you asked me to do. You, you said, never once pledged to me, sir, that no, you would not interrupt. And you, you're demonstrating by being here that you continue to interrupt. Man, I ain't trying to hear all that. Because at the end of the day, I did what you asked me to do. You told me, you told the bailiff to tell Mr. me. Mr. Brooks, this is not a debate. You told the bailiff to tell it's me that I had to write. It's not a debate. You asked to come over here, and I honored that, well, I, and I, I brought you back. I exercised my right three times. I shouldn't have had to do it three times. None of those opportunities that you wrote to me said, I pledge to not interrupt. I've never had to do that before. You've never, you've never required that before. That is actually not true, sir. You've never required that before. Every single time that I've been brought over there, after some time, sometimes very short, sometimes an extended Mr. Brooks, period of time. You are just simply trying to delay the inevitable. I'm, I'm, Please sit I down. I don't care about the inevitable. I, it was I already written from day one what hearing. was going to happen. It doesn't make me lose any sleep about that. I know I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay with everything. Then please I just sit down. Be, I just want to be treated fairly, which please, I have not been. Please sit down. And then you, Your Honor, and then you Mr. always make it seem this like is not you a always debate. make it seem like it's some type of aim, and it's not. Please sit down. We're talking about constitutional rights. You just told me, or you told the bailiff to tell me that I had to write to exercise a right that I should already have. I did that, not once, not twice, three times. And it still wasn't honored. And then I, I raised this sign. I'm, I'm Brooks, waving this for like 20 minutes you're, saying I would, want, I would want to come back. I'm doing this. You're hey, here now. Can I come back? Can I come back? Can so I come sit back? Down. It wasn't honored. And then I, had, so I, I said, can okay, finish. I'll write this and I'll see if your honor can see it on the screen. The objection sign saying... Mr. I've Brooks, exercised my right if to you be stop present. For a May minute, I have the order of the court? I'll explain it, but you have to stop I'm, so I'm not, I can explain I, it. Your Honor, you've never, I did what you asked me to do. Actually not. Yes. Let me explain the, and if, if I you would like. If I didn't, Your Honor, if I did not do what you asked me to do, then why did I? Why was I allowed to come back if I did not do what you asked me because to do? Because I'm frankly going to a very distinct portion of this hearing where I am going to impose sentence. Okay, that doesn't answer that the question though. Matters. That doesn't answer the question. Please sit down when, and I will explain and Donna, remain quiet with without due, interrupting me. With all due respect. That doesn't mean you're respecting me, you, so please you, sit down. With all due respect, you told the bailiff when I when I first said because every time that I've been brought over there in the past Mr. Brooks, you always stated, I don't need a history you always lesson stated of what I've done. That when I exercise my right to be present, Untrue. you Untrue. always said, Untrue. we have the record. We have the record. We can dig into the record. Mr. Brooks? I, I know what you. I know what the requirement was of me going, in, uh, going over there. You've always stated on the record that when I exercise my right to be present, you will bring me back if, I'm, if uh, I will follow the rules of decorum. That's it, your exact words, which you said every time. Which you're I've demonstrating never, right now that had, you have absolutely your Honor, your no Honor, ability to do. With all due respect, I've never had to go through any type of certain words that needed to be needed to be said or stressed or anything like that before. I've always done it the way that you've asked me to do it. No different than today when I told the bailiff I would like to be present. You told the bailiff. If he wants to be present, he has to put it in writing. And pledge to me it, that he will in, not interrupt me. I put it in writing. Without a pledge. 
so so why am I here? Because I'm going to move on to another phase of this hearing, and I thought it important that you be here in person. So, so I was here. But you didn't reclaim your right to be back here. Then why am I, I here, am then, Your Honor? I am allowing it to okay. happen. Okay, and, 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 I, and I respect that you're allowing it, but still, it, it doesn't answer the question, though, Your Honor. It does not answer the question. Mr. Brooks. As a, Your Honor, as a public Mr. Brooks. servant... I have the right to ask questions Sir, of your honor. I'm going to ask you one more time. And if you refuse to sit down, then you are in direct disobedience of a court order. Sit that, down and be quiet so I can make the appropriate can record. You, can you tell me what the, um, the court right, order he's is? He's not going to obey. He's now forfeiting I didn't, I didn't his right to be present. Obey. He will go into the I other court. I didn't say I wasn't going to obey. Court I didn't say I wasn't gonna obey. We'll be I in just recess until he's order. there. I just asked, what is the order? I didn't, I didn't say. Thank you. Please be seated.
course, I do need to first verify that they can hear and see us. I'm getting the thumbs up. We are back on the record. The record should reflect that Mr. Brooks is no longer in the main courtroom. He is in the adjoining courtroom. Um, I, of course, have been erring on the side of constitutional caution, but I would note that his right to be present at sentencing is a statutory right, um, which, frankly, I probably don't need to go through the findings under Illinois versus Allen, um, but I did. Um, but under whether it's a statutory right or a constitutional right, you can forfeit that right, and his behavior today has certainly demonstrated that he has forfeited his right to be present in this courtroom. Uh, during my sentencing remarks, he immediately came in. Um, I was on the bench looking through my paperwork. Uh, the courtroom wasn't even open, uh, and he started asking me questions. I said I wasn't going to answer them. He really had no respect for the proper decorum. Um, I needed it to be on the record. He d didn't seem to care about that, um, wanted to debate me about my prior rulings. Uh, bottom line is it's a statutory right for him to be present and uh, he's forfeited that right um, and I would just add that it's part of a pattern that has been demonstrated uh, during this trial that when uh, my perspective things are not going in his direction things are being said that he doesn't agree with uh, that he tends to act out, he disrupts, um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Once again, I'll confirm he can he and hear and see. We've got confirmation from the staff in the other courtroom. Um, one of the reasons I really spent the time going through uh, both my observations of uh, Mr. Brooks in terms of the mental health related issues and uh, first and then going through the uh, victim impact statements before I go through all of the necessary factors for sentencing is frankly it's challenging to talk about the impact to the victims without getting emotional. Um, this trial is unlike anything that I've ever been a part of the sheer magnitude of the crime, the number of people impacted, how they were impacted, the vicious, senseless nature of it, um, and hearing about the impact of all of that on our community members and the people who were at the parade, um, it's heart-wrenching. And um, I wanted to do that before I really got to the meat of sentencing um, because I also thought it was important to really spend some time recognizing and acknowledging the impact to the direct victims uh, who are in this courtroom and who have provided statements. Today, my focus in sentencing will be about November 21, 2021, the events shortly before that or leading up to it and after, and are not about Mr. Brooks's conduct during this trial, even though case law is very clear that his conduct at trial can and is a legitimate factor for the court to consider. Um, I need to make the record very clear that in no way what I do here today is based on Mr. Brooks exercising his right to a trial. That is a firmly embedded constitutional right, which I support, which I upheld. Um, of course, every person charged with a crime has a right to a trial. This court honored that right. I protected that right, even if Mr. Brooks treated it with contempt, disrespect, and at times like a game. But sentencing today is directly related to his conduct on November 21 of 2021 and the other sentencing factors, which, as I indicated previously, include the seriousness of the offense, the need to protect the public, and his character and rehabilitative needs.
Today I am tasked with sentencing Daryl Brooks for 76 counts related to a couple of moments in time. Moments that are tragic, moments that were frankly avoidable. My sentence here today is the purposes of it are twofold, really threefold if we think about the community. One, it is punishment. Two, protection of the community. And three, what I hope is justice and closure for the families and the community at large. I, of course, want to recognize and give due respect to the guilty verdicts that were rendered by the jury in this case. Not just 76 guilty verdicts, but the special verdict questions that they answered, including for counts one through six and seven through 67, that had the special verdict question related to the use of a dangerous weapon. So let me talk about the seriousness of this offense. The seriousness of the offense can be summed up, frankly, in one word, and that is attack. There is nothing, no other word, that can best describe what happened on November 21 of 2021 than the word attack. I talked about during my remarks regarding the trial about the opportunities that Daryl Brooks had to avoid this altogether. I put Exhibit 15 on the screen for a bit, which is the exhibit that details the map. The map of the parade, it starts with White Rock. It shows where uh, Sergeant Warner was at one point uh, farther up that parade route, uh, the staging area, and I believe if you look further up on Exhibit 15, it even depicts where White Rock School is, and that, of course, is where um, we saw the video of the altercation between Mr. Brooks, Corey Runkle, Nicholas Kirby, and Erica Patterson. Now, of course, there were moments in time before that, but that is really the, where things started, where I believe Mr. Brooks boiled over with rage and anger that he chose not to control on this date. He had a number of opportunities to simply drive in the other direction down White Rock, but he chose to drive toward Main Street, even though from the testimony, we know it was very evident that it was staging for a parade. There were many people, may not have been exactly by the school, but farther down White Rock. From Niagara forward is where that staging area was located and many people were there. The sights and sounds of a parade, the signs on the side of the road telling people not to park there, for example. Instead of turning around or instead of turning left onto East, East Main Street or left onto Pleasant, and despite Sergeant Warner trying to flag him down with and being in front of a squad with lights and a clear indication you should listen to or honor the even gestures of a police officer, and he was in uniform. He drives down White Rock Avenue and has contact with Detective Casey, who very clearly did everything he could to stop Mr. Brooks. 
and in that moment thinking it's a lost motorist. But Mr. Brooks chose to basically brush him aside with that SUV and drive on to Main Street. Past more people, past many spectators, and in a manner that was not just at a speed inappropriate for a parade, but frankly, that was reckless and endangered anyone who was on the roadway at that time, whether or not he hit anyone between White Rock and Maine and Barstow and Maine. But during that three block section of Main Street, he could have turned off Buckley, Northeast Avenue, Martin Street, or in either direction on Barstow. He could have stopped, asked for the police barricades to have been removed, or frankly turned his car around even at that point and gone back the way that he had come. But he didn't do that. He chose to drive recklessly, carelessly, and maliciously through a parade route and at anyone in his path where he struck not one, not two, not three, but 68 different people. We actually know that number's higher because we now know, um, we heard from uh, the two individuals who are with Extreme Dance, the one girl who was struck by one of the individuals who was clearly struck and that person flew into her. That would qualify for a charge based upon the state's description of how they chose to charge, it's just they didn't know until closer to the sentencing hearing. So 69 individuals if you include her. There are so many aggravating factors here, it's frankly difficult to even keep track of them all. The complete disregard for the lives of anyone else that day, someone described it as depraved indifference. And I think that is the perfect phrase to capture the actions of Mr. Brooks on November 21st of 2021. The aggravated factors of the numerous opportunities to turn around or not even enter the parade route or simply to stop. The fact that he mowed over and used that vehicle as a battering ram to hit 68 individuals, never once stopping with rage and anger at unsuspecting people at a parade who are there simply to kick off the holiday season to experience joy with their families. The intentionality of the conduct is outstanding. The viciousness, the speed, the swerving from side to side at various points. This was not a case of whodunit. From the very beginning, from when this case was charged, it was clear who did this. Now that is not to say that I prejudged this case, I did not. But after sitting through this trial, after watching the many videos, after listening to the testimony of the many, many dozens of witnesses, it is clear the state had overwhelming evidence of Mr. Brooks's guilt. What's also aggravated is his complete and utter lack of remorse. He spoke here today for two hours, one sentence, that's it, I'm sorry, no detail, two hours, one sentence, no empathy for any of these individuals, at times mocking them with hand gestures, or rolling his eyes multiple times 
That is not an indication or a sign of someone who has empathy, who is sorry for what he has done. We may never know the true why, but we were provided with nothing here today other than a feeble attempt to blame mental health, which frankly does a disservice to those who truly suffer from mental health issues. I understand why his family might cling to that because of the difficulty in coming to grips with a loved one doing such heinous things. But for Mr. Brooks, it's nothing more than indifference, deflection, and outright denial of what he did and the impact that he has caused as a result of his heinous actions. I searched for a mitigating factor in this case. I waited patiently for an apology, a true apology. I didn't get it. And not for my benefit, but for the victims. The law allows me to look at things such as Mr. Brooks's prior criminal history, including the history of criminal offenses and pending charges, the history of undesirable behavior patterns, which can include dismissed, uncharged, or unproven offenses or facts, even including expunged offenses, not really relevant here, acts resulting in probation revocation. Of course, those are part of his criminal history, nothing specific to these charges. I can look at his personality, character, and social traits, the vicious or aggravated nature of the crimes, the degree of his culpability, his, de his demeanor at trial and truthfulness, his age, his educational background, and employment record, his remorse, repentance, and cooperativeness, his need for close rehabilitative control, the rights of the public, the recommendations of the interested parties, including victims and family members of homicide victims. I can consider statements made by his own family. I can certainly consider the length of pretrial detention, which I'd note though, when facing six life sentences, is really a fraction of the time available to this court. The loss of life in this case is certainly one of the aggravating factors here today. The number of people injured, also an aggravating factor. The reach into the community, certainly palpable because this was a Christmas parade. I think it was a comment earlier either today or yesterday, that this was not like an one act where Mr. Brooks drove into a crowd of people. This was sustained driving from block to block to block to block, picking off people that were unsuspecting, 68, 69 times. Driving over people as if they were nothing more than speed bumps.
What's also aggravated is his conduct after he drove through the parade. Crashing his vehicle in an attempt to flee, it's pretty evident based upon the evidence and testimony from trial that Mr. Brooks had no idea there were these logs in that backyard that could damage his vehicle. He was attempting to flee when he ran over them and it ultimately disabled that vehicle and he was forced to abandon it. He ditched it, leaving personal identification information in it and his phone in a clear attempt to get out of there in a hurry. And then we have that series of videos that we saw at trial of him going through backyards, coming in contact with people, asking to use phones, ultimately ending up at Mr. Ryder's home, who graciously took him in. Never once Mr. Brooks showing any signs of distress, of any emotion of what he had just done. Cool, calm, collected. Certainly not a sign of someone who had any remorse for what he had just done. Someone who's involved in an accident, even a tragic accident, one where they flee the scene and are later caught, oftentimes show incredible remorse, tears. Not tears for themselves, but tears for what they've caused. A recognition of the loss of life, for example, from their conduct, nothing. An individual who simply wanted to flee. That is the epitome of consciousness of guilt evidence. Fleeing, changing your appearance, taking off the sweatshirt, not even caring that your shoes are off your feet because you're so intent on fleeing the area, putting your hair up from it being down. No doubt this is by far and away one of the most aggravated cases I've ever presided over, the sheer magnitude of the loss, the number of victims, the types of crimes for which the jury has convicted him. Six counts of intentional homicide, 61 counts of first degree recklessly endangering safety, six counts of hit and run, two counts of felony bail jumping, one count of misdemeanor battery. What's further aggravated is the fact that he was out on bond. He should have had no contact with Erica Patterson. But the rules mean nothing to Mr. Brooks. Nothing. He didn't care. This was someone who on two prior occasions charged with, frankly, causing mayhem. One, a reckless endangering safety for discharging a firearm. The other for battering and then running over Erica Patterson's foot. This court does get to consider the other act's evidence that the state sought to introduce at trial. That other act's evidence includes that on November 2 of 2021, Milwaukee police took a complaint from Erica Patterson that Mr. Brooks had run over her with his vehicle and tried to kill her. She had tire marks on her right pant leg she could not move her leg and had blood coming from her mouth. On that date, Mr. Brooks was driving the same vehicle that he drove through the parade. 
Erica Patterson was conveyed to Freydert Memorial Hospital. Her injuries received medical attention. She even had that boot on her leg on November 21 of 2021. She described Mr. Brooks to police as yelling at her, using profanity, as she tried walking past him when she was at a gas station. I think initially before that, at another location, but ultimately where he allegedly ran over her was at a gas station and caused the injury to her leg. Struck her in the face once with a closed fist, causing pain and bleeding without her consent. And then it was after she walked away that he followed her. When police had contact with him, he denied driving his mother's vehicle. When police had contact with him at his house, he ignored their commands because he was found in the vehicle, claiming that he was having an anxiety attack upon the site of the squad car and needed to get into the home to get his inhaler. When I say the rules don't matter to Mr. Brooks and court orders mean nothing, Mr. Brooks was in custody and there are jail phone calls where he's berating Erica Patterson, encouraging her to recant, blaming her for what had happened saying things on that phone call like, you trying to make it seem like everything is always everyone else's fault but yours, like you don't never do anything to cause shit. And the whole cause of this shit was something that you fucking did. He ended the call by telling Erica Patterson, you did this shit and you couldn't even keep your mouth shut after numerous people told you that shit. This ain't the place for you to be doing this shit and you still ran your mouth, and I'm the one sitting in here facing all this time. He repeatedly calls her a bitch. During a phone call on November 11th, Daryl Brooks is overheard or captured saying, why in the hell would I just try to mow her down knowing I could kill her like that? Like, okay, I probably got a few screws loose, but I ain't hardly no goddamn fool. He's complaining that she won't help post his bail. You didn't put a cent on my bail. Why should someone else have to pay for some shit you caused? The end, apparently, of that conversation, or at least moments later, he says to her, nah, I didn't try to do anything because if I tried to do something, you wouldn't be on the phone now. That's what you're not realizing. If I really tried to do something, you wouldn't be on the phone now. That is the rage and the anger that Mr. Brooks had on November 21 of 2021 when he tracked down Erica Patterson, confronted her. This wasn't about him getting money from her, like he lied to Detective Carpenter about. This was to confront her. He clearly hit her, we know that. This is the type of man that drove through the Christmas parade enraged because frankly, it's entirely possible that Corey Runkel and Nicholas Kirby saved the life of Erica Patterson. It, it's clear, Mr. Brooks was hell bent 
to cause harm to her, but she was able to get free, run back to her friends. Who knows what would have happened but for their intervention. If you think back to the testimony of Nicholas Kirby, he felt bad for threatening Mr. Brooks, like somehow this was his fault. He was just trying to be there for his friend, someone he recently met. So Mr. Brooks, that other act's evidence is a very clear indication of your poor moral character. It demonstrates unequivocally that you have absolutely no remorse for anything that you do. You have no empathy for anyone. And that you are justified in the actions that you take. In addition, To that conduct, as part of your character, this court is able to look at and consider your prior record. And I'm well aware, sir, that you're raising an objection sign, but you have forfeited your right to be here, and I will not stop, and you will not be brought into this courtroom. I will continue. This is his prior record, going back to... Two thousand and two thousand, spanning what Nevada, Georgia, at least police contact in Georgia. We have an unknown disposition in Wisconsin. Substantial battery in two thousand, party to a crime, put on probation. Ultimately, that was revoked. He went to prison. Two thousand two, felony possession of THC jail time, 2003, resisting obstructing, obstructing jail time, 2005, a disorderly conduct ticket, but he failed to pay the forfeiture and ended up serving an alternate, alternative to incarceration, sorry, he ended up serving um, for failing to pay 30 days jail. 2009, obstructing two days jail, meaning he lied to police. 2010, strangulation, battery was dismissed and read in, put on probation, ultimately revoked, serving 11 months jail. 2012, misdemeanor bail jumping, possession of THC, with a number of other charges being dismissed and read in, 180 days jail concurrent. Also in 2012, a misdemeanor resisting or obstructing. So either he lied or he fled from police or did something to make their job more difficult. 37 days jail consecutive. In Nevada in 2006, domestic battery, a suspended sentence, obstructing after being found guilty at trial for which he served jail time. 2007, statutory sexual seduction as a felony. This is for impregnating Erica Patterson when she was a minor. 2016 charged with uh, not being in compliance with the sex offender registry uh, requirements for which there is an outstanding warrant. In Georgia, a 2021 arrest for battery domestic violence, presumably with Erica Patterson based upon where she came from at that time. But I won't make, it's, I say presumably, but Frankly, doesn't matter who it was with. We also know that there's the 2003 paternity case out of Waukesha County. Why is that relevant? Because eight times during that case, a warrant has been issued for contempt of court, meaning for failure to pay his financial obligations to a child or children. The pending cases for which he... One pending case, I should say, he was, I don't believe, charged with bail jumping for that one. Uh, the 20 CF 2550, two counts of recklessly using a weapon, felon in possession of a firearm, 
released ultimately in March of 2021. He's accused in that case of firing a shot. There were two, two occupants in a vehicle. One was his nephew, and when he was picked up by police, a loaded Beretta, 9 millimeter, which had previously been reported as stolen, was found in his possession. I already talked about the other acts evidence, that is the, uh, for which he was charged with felony bail jumping, the second degree recklessly endangering safety for allegedly running over Erica Patterson, the battery DV, DC DV, and a resisting obstructing. And then the second would be those, he was charged with intimidation of a victim, felony bail jumping for conduct on November 8th, so November 2nd, November 8th. This is clearly someone with a demonstrated violent history and past, someone who has absolutely no regard for anyone but himself. To say that he is a lifelong criminal, I think is accurate. He disobeys law enforcement, he disrespects court orders, and he certainly demonstrated that he has no respect for these proceedings. Multiple acts of violence, violent, dangerous behavior that predated the attack on the Waukesha Christmas Parade. His character or lack thereof is also demonstrated by his complete and utter denial of culpability in this case. His blaming of his mental health or alleged mental health. There's no evidence that he was suffering from a manic episode. I went through all of that earlier today, going through the four reports related to the special plea, none of those doctors found support for his special plea. Mr. Brooks talked about at times this being the will of God or that all things happen for a reason. I'm here to tell you, Mr. Brooks, you are not an instrumentality of God. Death may be inevitable to all of us, but you cut the lives of six individuals short. You, you alone, Mr. Brooks, cut the lives of these six innocent people short. I talked earlier about how I believe he's intelligent, deliberate, and purposeful in what he does. I've considered that you have treatment needs. Perhaps there are intersecting mental health issues as it relates to your personality disorder, but those issues can best be addressed in a confined setting where the Department of Corrections will be charged statutorily to evaluate you and to provide any medical or mental health treatment that you need. This is a case that falls squarely on the need to protect the community. I referenced this earlier. There's really three primary reasons for the sentences I will impose here today. One is punishment, one is to protect the community, and the other is to provide justice and closure to the victims. Because under that category of need to protect, the court does get to consider the impact of these crimes on the victims. I went through at length in reviewing all of those victim impact statements. I certainly didn't go through every single one, just highlighting some of them, but doing so with purpose because it is very clear to this court that Mr. Brooks has caused carnage, mayhem, 
It has resulted in many people suffering P from PTSD, from mental and emotional trauma that will take a lifetime to recover from, and for some, perhaps, if at all. You have taken away from these individuals future memories. They will never have birthdays with the six individuals who were killed. There will be no weddings. There will be no graduations. There will be none of the milestones that these families were looking forward to, whether it be for a, an innocent eight-year-old or an innocent 79-year-old. Frankly, Mr. Brooks, no one is safe from you. This community can only be safe if you are behind bars for the rest of your life. The actions of Daryl Brooks demand punishment. The community is not safe from your violent and criminal conduct unless you are in custody. You left a path of destruction, chaos, death, injury, confusion, and panic as you drove seven or so blocks through the Christmas parade, never once stopping or seemingly caring about the wake of carnage that you left. Four of those blocks were turned into a scene that frankly is no different than a war zone. On counts one through six, this court is imposing a life sentence without the possibility or eligibility for extended supervision consecutive to one another. One life sentence for Virginia Sorensen. One life sentence for Leanna Owen. One life sentence for Tamara Durand. One life sentence for Jane Kulik. One life sentence for Bill Hospel. And one life sentence for Jackson Sparks. I've considered the enhancer and the additional five years that I could impose, but I don't need to really order that because I've not made him eligible for extended supervision and it would only be to increase his time on initial confinement. But make no mistake, Mr. Brooks, you use that vehicle as a battering ram, no different than frankly a firearm. On counts 7 through 67, these are 61 counts of first degree recklessly endangering safety. These charges alone and these convictions without the enhancer carry a maximum of 12 and a half years. Because of the enhancer, a total of 17 and a half years. And under Wisconsin law, the five years is added to the initial term of confinement. So what could be seven and a half years is a maximum of 12 and a half years. And I'd ask that everyone no longer show any reaction to the sentence so I can get through this. On counts seven through 67, on each count, I will impose a total sentence of 17 and a half years. 12 and a half years of initial confinement plus five years of extended supervision consecutive to any other sentence that I've imposed here today. That is 762 and a half years of initial confinement and 305 years of extended supervision on top of the life sentences that I've imposed. That is 17 and a half years, sir, for Nicole White. 17 and a half years for Eleanor Andrews, Anders, excuse me, 17 and a half years for Sasha Catalan Castillo, 17 and a half years for Maura Gilchrist, 17 and a half years 
for Justin Gullickson. 17 and a half years for Harry Gilfoy. 17 and a half years for Aiden Lofgren. 17 and a half years for Theo Maza. 17 and a half years for Tyler Pudliner. 17 and a half years for Connor Tank. 17 and a half years for Eric Teagues. 17 and a half years for Adelia Mafioli. 17 and a half years for Kelly Graybow. 17 and a half years for Josh Craner. 17 and a half years for Riley Rogers. 17 and a half years for Caden Rogers. 17 and a half years for Tucker Sparks. 17 and a half years for Isabella Bartlett. 17 and a half years for Yaritzi Becerra Montez. 17 and a half years for Samantha Coelho. 17 and a half years for Madison Hollingsworth. 17 and a half years for Mackenzie Hollingsworth. 17 and a half years for Mitchell Lampine. 17 and a half years for Kathleen Peelmeyer. 17 and a half years for Julia Schleikow. 17 and a half years for Olivia Stover. 17 and a half years for Jennifer Stover. 17 and a half years for Jessalyn Torres. 17 and a half years for Alice Urell. 17 and a half years for Charlotte Urell. 17 and a half years for Vivian Urell. 17 and a half years for Grayson Urell. 17 and a half years for Lola Hospel. 17 and a half years for Tamara Rosentreter. 17 and a half years for Betty Strang. 17 and a half years for Maria Alvarez Dominguez. 17 and a half years for Gregoria Romelia Perez. 17 and a half years for Elliot Hallmark. 17 and a half years for Benjamin Hallmark. 17 and a half years for Patrick Heppy. 17 and a half years for Lori Locken. 17 and a half years for Marisol Lopez Gutierrez. 17 and a half years for Adair Lopez Rubelar. 17 and a half years for Juan Marquez. 17 and a half years for David Marquez. 17 and a half years for William Mitchell. 17 and a half years for Jason Petchloff. 17 and a half years for Margaret Pachulis. 17 and a half years for Yamalet Perales Alvarez. 17 and a half years for Island Perales Alvarez. 17 and a half years for Ashley Perales Alvarez. 17 and a half years for Jose Perales Alvarez. 17 and a half years for Maria Perez. 17 and a half years for Camilla Perez Gonzalez. 17 and a half years for Isaac Foglia. 17 and a half years for Deborah Ramirez. 17 and a half years for Charles Green. 17 and a half years for Lily Green. 17 and a half years for Brinley Harris. 17 and a half years for Kelsey Knapp. 17 and a half years for Owen Brasciati. On counts 68 through 73, which are the six counts of hit and run resulting in death, these are 25 year felonies each. The court will do the following. On count 68, a 25 year total sentence, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision. This will be concurrent to count one. Count 69, the same sentence, 25 years total, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision, concurrent to count, six, to count two. Did I say that the right way, the first one? Okay, count 68 is concurrent to count one, 
Count 69 is concurrent to count two. Count 70, 25 years total, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision, concurrent to count three. Count 71, 25 years total, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision, concurrent to count four. Count 72, 25 year total, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision, concurrent to count five. And on count 73, a 25 year total sentence, 15 years of initial confinement, 10 years of extended supervision, concurrent to count six. On count 74 and 75, the two felony counts of bail jumping, the court is ordering a six year sentence total on each count, three years of initial confinement, three years of extended supervision, consecutive to all other counts, but concurrent with one another. And lastly, but certainly not least, the maximum sentence for the battery to Erica Patterson, nine months consecutive to any other sentence. To order anything other than what I have done, sir, would be to unduly depreciate the seriousness of these offenses. Would, it is needed, although largely symbolic, given the number of years that I have imposed here today, because frankly, you deserve it. I know it's symbolic, but it needs to hold you accountable in a very real and tangible way. For all of these sentences that I have imposed, I will order the following conditions. No contact with the victims as identified in the amended victim key or their families. No contact of any kind with Erica Patterson. You are to pay restitution in the amount of $47,193.29 to EMC Insurance Company, that's on behalf of the Waukesha School District and $124,220.65 to the Crime Victim Compensation Program. I am ordering DNA surcharges on all counts. On counts one through 75, it's $250. On count 76, it's $200. Those are mandatory under the law. I'm also imposing the domestic abuse surcharge on count 76 of $100. I'm also imposing all standard court costs on all counts. Although my primary emphasis is that restitution be paid before costs, surcharges, and fees, I will order that restitution costs and fees be paid out of prison money. Um, in other words, that all financial obligations shall be collected pursuant to statutory provisions as requested by the state. That's frankly a standard, it's customary. Uh, but it will be in the judgment of conviction. And then pursuant to 949.165, I'll find that it is appropriate for this court to order an escrow account under 949.165 for payment of restitution, costs, fees, surcharges, and even for costs associated with prior legal representation or future representation under the statute. Mr. Brooks has been convicted of a number of serious crimes for which this section is appropriate. I will order 360 days credit as to count one and count 68. Only all other counts, zero days credit because of the consecutive nature of the sentences that I've imposed here today. I calculated that uh, with my sentence calculator. Of course, that is through yesterday because these sentences commence today. There are a number of advisements I must go through. Um, first of all, Mr. Brooks will be provided with a written explanation of determinate life sentence regarding uh, the first degree intentional homicide charges. Of course, he's not eligible for release to extended supervision. That form uh, defines uh, extended confinement for him, and there's um, other language on here that he can read at his convenience. He also will be provided with the notice of right to seek post-conviction relief form. Um, the court will fill out the caption for him. He is instructed to review it uh, and review the defendant's acknowledgement, make the appropriate selection, sign and date it, and return that to the court. 
I must advise you, sir, you have been convicted of a felony. That means you may not vote in any election until your civil rights are restored. You may not possess a firearm. You may not possess body armor. Both of those are punishable as felonies. You also have 20 days from today's date to appeal the decision of this court. Does the state believe I've overlooked anything here today? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right, those documents will be provided to Mr. Brooks. I will note for the record at many times during my final sentencing remarks, he was holding up an objection sign. That objection is noted for the record. This now concludes this hearing and this case. We are now off the record. Do you want to do the motion to stay pending appeal or we could do um, it another day? I want day. to wait until I sign the judgment of conviction. Um, I'm not making any determinations uh, regarding where he is to be held. Um, that certainly is within the, once the judgment of conviction of sign is signed, I'll address the motion for stay pending appeal. Uh, but my understanding is he needs to be transported to Milwaukee and I will, not in this, I will not stand in the way of that. All right, I'll schedule that once the judgment of conviction is signed. Understood. We are Thank in recess. You. Okay. Thank you everyone.